Evening, everyone, to episode 68 of Talking Landscape Photography Show. We have a wonderfully um, broad and international panel here tonight. We have Matt Palmer, 2019 and extended 2020-21. God knows how long Australian Photographer of the Year has <laughs> had the longest reign in history. <laughs> we have uh, Tim Parkin, the editor of our Landscape Magazine, and Alex Nail, and together the two of them um, very, very thankfully have uh, offered their time to come on board because uh, a quite short notice release. I'm very impressed. It's, it's early morning over there um, in the evening here. So we'll, uh, we'll, let them, we'll let them off the bag. I think Alex has been up particularly this morning, being very active by the sounds of it. <laughs> um, so we're going to um, give a bit of breathing room to reflect on the Natural Landscape Awards, Photography Awards tonight. And... The reason being, well, there's many reasons. As you probably guessed, Nick and Luke and I are all pretty straight shooters, really, for, for that regard. And it's really quite excited to see a platform, a very timely platform, global platform, arrive in the world that brings up that element of conversation about authenticity and to the landscape and, and realism and how far, you know, and, and diverse the kind of aspects we have of our expression with photography versus, you know, being true to the landscape versus you know, getting completely fantastical through through post-production and other sort of techniques. And, and you know, to have the, the founders sort of on the show to speak to that is, is quite exciting, really, because we've probably got our own ideas about the intentionality behind it. But um, to get it from the horse's mouth would be, be exceptionally good. And also, we'll get time later in the show. We'll have a chat to Matt about his project-winning um, um, series on Ash. It's on incredible ongoing work, and it's also part of the series that, that won him Australian Photography of the Year, and rightfully so. And we'll reflect a little bit on the on the um, the actual images themselves, um, kind of from a panel sort of perspective. And Tim and Alex have taken the breaks off and freed themselves to comment if they choose to, which is nice. <laughs> and yeah, we'll we'll get the show rolling. So Nick, do you want to um, introduce Alex? You know a bit more about him. Maybe where <laughs> Jimmy goes to and where he irons his shirts or. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know those uh, intimate details at all, uh, <laughs> Paul. But anyway, uh, yes, we'd like to welcome Alex Nail live from the, the UK. Alex is a, uh, a full-time landscape photographer based in, in Bath in England. Um, he focuses most of his work on, on mountains and the more um, literal uh, landscape or illust illustrative uh, landscape, I suppose. And... Um, uh, uh, does a lot of hiking into inaccessible areas uh, and areas that are, um, you know, uh, covered in snow and, and that sort of thing. And he produces stunning work in the, the natural light that's presented. His work um, is uh, very much in the ethos of the Natural Landscape Photography Awards, of which he is, of course, a co-founder, as is uh, Tim Parker, who we have, and Paul will be introducing. And... Uh, uh, it's it's great to have him here on the show. Uh, a lot of his work is based in in Scotland, in the in the mountains, uh, and also the Drakensberg um, on the border of uh, South Africa and Lesotho, and uh, also lots of work in in Iceland as well. Uh, he has a wonderful um, a wonderful website and a, a terrific YouTube channel actually that um, has lots and lots of um, excellent tutorials and. Um, um, constructive uh, critique sessions and uh, adventures such as his trips into the Drakensberg and it's definitely a, one of those um, photography channels that if you're not already following him um, it's definitely worth su subscribing to him for some of the, the better uh, landscape photography content that's out there. Uh, so welcome Alex and uh, welcome to uh, sunny Tasmania here via the internet. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Oh, yeah, and he also has uh, got a wonderful book too, Northwest. Isn't that right, Nick? Ah, yes. Sorry, Alex, just before you, but, yeah, you, you it's, go, it's, it's, I, um, <laughs> I, I do want to mention his um, his wonderful book that um, came out, I think, at the end of 2018 into 2019, if that's right. Uh, it's called Northwest, um, and it's based on um, Alex's um, photography in uh, the northwest of Scotland, in the, the mountains of that area, and... Um, it's um, uh, an absolutely astoundingly beautiful book. I was lucky to get one of the um, limited editions that uh, Alex mailed out at great expense here to, to Tasmania. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a, a beautiful example of 
of that that grand landscape and the the light working within it uh, in the beautiful mountains of of Scotland and um, it's a real uh, testament to your work, Alex. So well done and uh, again welcome. Thanks, Nick. No, that that's really kind of you. Um, I don't want to uh, throw the same level of compliments back your way because that would make for a kind of gross podcast where we're all complimenting <laughs> you a too heavily. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've really I've really enjoyed seeing your your work and, and Luke's work in particular. I'm less familiar with Paul and, and Matt, I have to say, um, but yeah, you you guys gave me the the wanderlust for. Uh, Tasmania, which I may or may not fulfil now, but uh, yeah, I, lo I love seeing your work. Yeah, we we're just talking before about whether you'd actually get over here. Let's talk about that with Lukey. Yeah, it's uh, it's waiting for you, my friend. It's um, it's easily one of the most fantastic wilderness areas in the world um, in terms of variety and scope and what's packed into a tiny place. It's there's nowhere else on earth I've seen like it actually, and I've, I've been a few places. Uh, there's certainly areas of speciality and uniqueness in other areas of the world more so, but to have just about everything you can possibly imagine in one place is 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 one of the um, mm. the great nuances of living here. So uh, including the four seasons in a day weather. <laughs> yes. So Tim, uh, mine's going to be short and sweet, my friend, because uh, yeah, British aren't good Thanks at some lathering stuff all over people. It's it's more of an American thing. I've got <laughs> a bit of American blood, so I can get away with that. But uh, Tim, Tim's one of the great stalwarts and and modern. Um, and contemporary um, British photography. He's based in Scotland. Uh, currently, he's the editor and founder for On Landscape Magazine, which is one of the preeminent magazines in that part of the world, if not the world. And just going through some of it today is, you know, the, the depth and scope and breadth and variety of, of information, education, inspiration that runs all the way through that. It's, it's really high caliber. It's really, really, really well considered and thought through and a bit of a lodestone in the world, I think, in terms of um, a resource and access point to what's happening in not only that part of the world, but the rest of the world as well. I, I, um, I noticed she had an article on uh, Caroline Cheng actually just lately, and um, she's, a, she's a good friend and, and was actually one of my clients. That, uh, I, was, I actually organised custom area workshops for her around Australia, which she got a lot of images that she's now known for. Uh, cool. uh, yeah. But now she's got so good, she's, uh, she's, she's all on her own, and I just come along for the ride when she's in this neck of the woods, which is, which is pretty great. So, um, yeah, Tim, you're the, also one of the co-founders for, for the awards. So we'll, we'll get back to that and we'll probably give you guys the front show shortly in terms of um, giving a voice to that. So our other guest tonight is the wonderful Matt Palmer. Very, very beautifully trimmed beard there, mate. I like that. I've, I've, I've got to do a bit of work on mine and catch up to the, the styling. But I'll um, hats off. What do we got behind there? Oh, it, that's, oh, that's the image. That, is that the image I own? I can't think. It's close. Uh, no, you've got Wattle Tree. Oh, Wattle Tree, it's close. Um, I can't that's quite the see. cockatoo and the um, burnt tree. And there's, a few rib, there's a few ribbons there which uh, represent probably fairly important things that Matt, I'm sure, would love to tell you all about personally. <laughs> Not. Yeah, I don't know about that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, you know, Matt's, um, Matt's uh, the, the current Australian Photographer of the Year um, and he's had a long run thanks to COVID. Uh, <laughs> he's also a very significant figure in the Australian sort of landscape community, really. Um, He's a big supporter and component of the IPP for a while now. Um, he's an environmentalist, conversation, a conservationist, a lot like me, and he actually put up his hand to come on the latest Light Collective project uh, on the Takina, um, which I was really grateful for, and that's continuing. And um, COVID's taken a little bit of a slow point on that one. But, um, yeah, Tim and Alex, if you haven't heard of a group, the Light Collective, they're... Um, they were very proud of their work and uh, I'm a part of that group and, and Luke's actually come on board for this project as well. Uh, this latest one that's, um, yeah. Anyway, that's another, another thing. So tonight we'll, um, we'll come back around full circle. Basically we've got a great panel of pretty happening, uh, capable, um, shooters basically. And I think we all have quite a propensity relatively speaking towards, you know, the respecting and honoring the authenticity of the landscape and, the transparency of realism when it is or isn't present um, in the landscape world is an ongoing conversation and you can either get a bee under your bonnet or you, or you can be a bit more proactive and, and thoughtful about how um, how you approach that issue and, and what they've done with this Natural Landscape Photography Awards is very, very clearly one of the most, one of the best platforms I've seen in the world in terms of, you know, and it's just started being inaugural, I don't know, how you managed to get almost 14,000 entries on your very first awards. It's already one of the biggest awards of the world in its first year. So uh, I don't know what you guys have got planned for next year, but you might have to get a few extra staff for the judging. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to shut up for a while, which I don't do very often, obviously, but um, 
I'd love to hear from either of you guys, I guess, starting with, you know, where did, where was the seed come from and what was your intention? And, and, and we'll move further on from there about, um, about some of the intricacies and ins and outs and, and learnings of, of the, what it's been like for you guys pulling that together. I think, Tim, I'll let I you think go. Alex, well, I'll, I'll describe a little bit because I, me and Alex probably started some of this between us by being, uh, I don't know, photo forensic scientists as much as it goes. We we used to go online, find out uh, some of the some of the worst excesses of um, Photoshop jiggery pokery, and I think we got ourselves a bit of a, a name for um, critiquing some of the competitions out there. I think we've only killed one winning uh, photographer, haven't we? Alex? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was actually, uh, yeah, there was there was a winner of the UK Landscape Photographer of the Year who uh, unfortunately had composited his photos and that was against the rules of the competition and uh, I think kind of offensive to Tim and I as well because of course ultimately mm. whoever you pick as the winner you're holding up as the best landscape photographer in the UK. That's, so did, that's you, did you do a big takedown operation, did you? Mm. Well, I mean, we, we were fairly straightforward, actually. Um, we didn't make it personal or anything, although naturally it's uh, kind of hard to avoid it coming across as, yeah, as personal. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Sounds like my sort of investigation, actually. I would have enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, t- Tim and I have uh, have had those uh, messages back and forth for, for some time, not not just um, about how real the images are, but even the, the standard of the winners that have been selected. Um, because actually a lot of competitions have a judging panel that aren't photographers. And so you get choices that are based on non-photography reasons. For example, how well an image might look in the Sunday Times magazine. Um, And uh, so we've had lots of conversations over the years about what an ideal competition might look like. And um, I think the straw that broke the camel's back was uh, the wildlife photographer of the year. And uh, they lost their landscape category um so maybe tim can pick up on on that yeah what, what do you I mean they lost it as in they gave it away or something happened or they just <laughs> i think behind a cupboard somewhere down at the science museum <laughs> <laughs> they uh, basically it was it was they had a wild landscape category and that was always the, the sort of reference category for landscape and there's there's a plants and fungi category as well but the the wild was the I don't know the prestigious landscape win and and the wildlife photographer of the year are one of the only competitions outside of journalism that does rigorous raw checking and that's been my role for uh, around about seven years now uh, so I would go through well originally it was I'd spend a whole week going through every raw file now these days I go through just the finalists uh, it may be the last five hundred or so and. And up until that point, it was like, well, you know, we don't need one. If anybody wants to enter a competition that's established and rigorous, then they can look at the wildlife photographer of the year. It wasn't perfect, but it was it was good. And then so, when they uh, went, has a lot of has a lot of integrity turned by the sounds of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and the judging process there is fantastic as well, although it is obviously judged by wildlife photographers, which does have a an impact on the choices for landscape. I uh, might come back to that one later, but w- yeah. when that they've got rid of that and started having the categories based on biomes, so uh, forests or or marshes, I think is in the latest wildlife photographer of the year. Mm. And I got chatting with Alex about it and having a little moan as we normally do. I think going back ten years, uh, and and Alex mentioned that a guy Matt in the US had been moaning as well, didn't you, Alex? Yeah, I mean, Matt, Matt Payne, um, who, who hosts a rival podcast, a much better podcast than you know. Um, yeah, he, uh, <laughs> We've had him on here. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he had, he had me on uh, uh, early doors, um, you know, d- discussing my photography. And we, we got onto this subject of reality in photography. And I think myself and, and then a debate with Erin Babnik and, and discussing with a few other people, he completely changed his mind on reality and photography. I think it became very important to him. Um, and, and so, you know, I then had lengthy conversations uh, with, with him up to that end. And he'd talked about uh, making a competition just in passing. And so then when Tim mentioned it, it was like this, this perfect thing, because, of course, for, for a competition to really 
work you need it to go big fairly quickly you want entrance because otherwise it just doesn't have any impact it becomes this little niche thing um which is funny because that's what petapixel were basically saying yesterday to us when we were trying to promote <laughs> the winners and actually we said well actually we're one of the biggest competitions in the world um which you know to have that initial momentum which came largely um through having this US UK base and, and particularly with with Matt's podcast was a huge advantage. Um, so yeah, t- Tim and Matt initially uh, put put the foundation in place. I think. Did Did you have any clarity about the volume of audience and where it was from relative to you know Europe versus the states? Yeah, we we did a little bit of stats on it, and I think it was something like forty percent US, forty uh, percent Europe. Uh, and maybe 20% UK. So there's still quite a lot of UK entries. Oh, so uh, and about keep five... remembering that Europe and UK are the same thing anymore. Sorry, yeah. I'm not quite used to that. Oh, it's still Europe, but I'm, under, I'm subdividing that uh, out of Europe. Maybe a third of it was from the UK entries, probably because of on landscape. But I mean, there are a lot of landscape photographers in the UK. Um, did, and then did you, find, I think... did you find it a bit unexpected that, I mean, 14,000 is huge for the number of entries. Like, is that is that something you is that beyond expectations? I would assume, or no, way way beyond expectations. Yeah, we we had a we had a target to make sure we covered costs, and even then we were happy to lose some money on it because we thought it was important. And a first year, we'd be happy to keep it going. And I think that was, I think the the covering the basic costs. So we didn't get we don't get paid anything else. All our expenses wouldn't get paid. Was basically the prize money. Um, and and that got covered quite quickly. So we were, we were quite reassured quickly that it was going to cover its costs after about a month. But um, but I was told by the people who run the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, expect everything to come at the end. Everybody's last minute. And and we were yeah. like, yeah, yeah, perhaps. So, you know, we, we may get like the last extra 10% in the last day or two, but it turned I've out got, it was I've like the last 60%. In, um, two hours before this show with three minutes to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everybody did. Yeah. I was getting seriously worried about our servers and my software at that point in time. Yeah, it's 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 a consistent factor, I think. Us, uh, us last minute winger photographers, there's plenty of us out there. Yeah. So one, one thing oh. for me that really struck a beautiful point was the accessibility of it financially. So was it 12 images for $60 or something like that? Is you know, it was I just paid literally $80 per image today for Australian awards, which right. albeit are a print awards, so it's a whole different process and cost factor involved, but and lots of hands on and, and it's a totally different scheme. But you know, it was a massive investment, relatively speaking. And straight away, I felt like it just, yeah, I, I used the word already, but that beautiful sense of accessibility about it. And that that is a price point that's quite different from a lot of what's happening around the world in most of the competitions. And that really just felt it gave me a sense of freedom personally about expressing myself or going a bit wider or trying some things I might not otherwise because when you've got you know large amounts of money per single image when you're just going oh my god it's got to be worth it you, you sort of different factors in your mind and your being come into play that aren't necessarily the right things to really engage with mm-hmm. um, I find sometimes so so all of a sudden I felt like oh I could spread my wings a bit here and um I was going to enter regardless just because I love what it stood for. But um, what was your sort of thought process behind, you know, the accessibility and, and pricing? I, I think that that, that's kind of an interesting story in itself because actually we priced almost, I think, three times higher initially. Because you can imagine we, we had to sit down with a piece of paper and say, how many entries are we going to get and how do we fund our prizes? And so we did the calculations, guessed how many entrants we were going to have and came up with a number which was slightly lower than other international competitions, but still far more than we were charging uh, ultimately. But one thing that we'd also decided to do fairly early on is be completely open with the community and, and take their feedback. And when we announced that, most people were still fairly happy because it was you know, in line with, with other competitions, but a few people were very unhappy. They felt like we were sort of price gouging and trying to make money ourselves. Um, and Sandra Bartoka in particular, who, uh, who then became one of our judges was very vocal um, publicly, very uh, aggressively vocal as she <laughs> is, which is part of the reason why she's, uh, she's such a good, good judge. She's, she doesn't mince her words. Um, and, and so we then just dropped our, our prices dramatically when, when we realised just how much the competition had struck a chord as well. So we realised that we would have more entrance. 
Um, and, and I think that was a really good decision because uh, it made it so much more accessible to people. What other sort of feedback did you um, get? Or maybe not feedback, but but um, thoughts that, that other people had provided you guys maybe even before the competition was thought up um, as to what sort of things people wanted to see in, in, in a competition like this? Had you, had you had any sort of other other things apart from it just being natural in, in terms of maybe the, the categories and, and that sort of thing? I mean, I, I think so much of that comes through having these conversations over a period of years. So I would say that, um, you know, Matt and, and Tim and, and myself and, and Rajesh all had a very good idea of what we'd like to see from a competition. And that was largely built through chatting with with the community so we didn't actually bring people in much in in that respect but certainly when it came to setting up the awards and people seeing what we were presented we had a whole load of feedback we were constantly changing how we were presenting different categories we were constantly clarifying things and trying to help people understand what we were trying to achieve so it's a lot around the messaging and the ethos mm. um because yeah i mean it's it's funny until you created the awards you actually don't it's very hard to spot the kind of things that people might find confusing or, or mm. whatever. So, yeah, yeah we, it, it's funny because I think when people imagine setting up awards, you sort of create your rules and then you create your categories and you put up a prize fund and, you know, have an entry button and, and that's it. But actually we did weekly meetings, constantly changing our messaging, putting out articles um, and, and really making sure that everybody was, was committed to it. And, and now that, we have the results we have a lot of feedback and we're encouraging feedback yeah. um to try and uh you know Im improve the awards next year and, and we have lots of ideas for doing that yeah it, it really sort of hit um a sweet spot in my thinking so apart from the overall ethos of it being the, the natural landscape awards and the and the rules that that brought on um the actual categories themselves hit a real sweet spot for me in, in the way I've, I've been thinking over the years and the way I've um, been discouraged myself to enter my work in, in particular competitions. Um, for example, just putting an aerial category in for me um, was, was great because I don't shoot aerial and uh, particularly in Australian competitions, aerial is a massive thing, as as, as Paul and Luke will tell you. Uh, and I always felt that the abstract nature of and the beautiful um, um, images that come from aerials were very different to what I was shooting. Uh, and so to see aerial put in its own category was very encouraging for me. And then also to see nightscape put in its own category was very encouraging too. It meant that those that focus on nightscapes had a chance against these other things that sometimes overwhelm. Um, we've certainly seen here in Australia that Ariel has overwhelmed some uh, competitions um, in the past, although I might be overstating it. Uh, but it was, it, it, to me, it really seemed to hit a sweet spot. And ironically, <laughs> I didn't end up entering, uh, which is another story in itself. And I apologise and I will enter next year. But um, <laughs> it, it, was, uh, it was really great to see. Um, did you get that sort of feedback from other people as well? Or, or have your, has it, you had feedback since about changing the categories from here or, or tweaking them a bit or anything like that? Yeah, yeah we had a... We had a a lot of discussion. I mean, the the aerial and nightscape one was a was a conscious choice to to split out. I mean, we 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 found that they are very very unique. And I mean, an example is the wildlife photographer of the year, which is um, a great competition. But their their landscape category would end up with a lot of aurora volcanoes um, and aerial shots th spread through them because they are they're very attractive. They're very um, sublime you know it's, it's it's what you want to capture in photography in many ways but it's but quite obvious in a way sometimes i mean aerial is that's its power in many ways is this abstraction is this wonder of what you've got but that power also can overwhelm the other categories so i mean we're still working on this we may we may not we may try and bring aerial back into the main category but have it labeled as such so that we can have a um some differentiator in somehow we're still not sure about this yet I'll, I'll but in the main category because in, in australia we we've been through and kind of out the other side of that process in terms of the app awards like there was a lot of feedback matt's probably a better person to speak to this probably but um 
early on that you know we've had two winners in the last six or seven years that have been aerial based uh, in the Australian Awards, which means I've got no chance for the next ten or fifteen years. But anyway, uh, and you know I've probably been purely entering aerials for a decade now already, and. So in recognition of that, they built in their own specialist category just for aerials for a while there as well. And now they've actually sort of come back out this other side and, and reintegrated them back into the general kind of pool, I guess, because, you know, it had its heyday. And, and actually, to be perfectly honest, they're judged really hard um, these days because there's so much of it out there. And Australian photographers in particular are, are very, very experienced uh, in that genre and they know what's good and what's not. And it, it's actually much harder to stand out than you think. Personally, I, I think I mentioned this already to, um, to, to I think one of you guys, but I, um, you know, I think for me personally as an artist, like one of the beauties of aerial photography, particularly abstract work is it's, is that abstraction that it could be a macro shot. It could be from outer space. It could be, you know, underwater, it could be in a cave. And, and to me that mystery is stripped away by being forced to admit how it's taken. And so personally, as an artist, I find that quite frustrating and quite limiting. And often that might even influence what I end up putting in because the mystery is just taken, taken back and the level of interpretation is narrowed um, consequentially as a result. Um, Matt, have you got any thoughts about that? Um, well, I think your image that won the aerial category is probably quite representative of that view, Paul. Um, that's an image that if you didn't have that context you just have no idea. And even as an aerial, you almost have no idea of what's going on. Um, so I can appreciate that point of view with your work, especially um, something pricked my ears up a little bit before, and that was around pricing of competitions. And I think it's important as an entrant um, to consider price, but also to consider value and that um, something that's cheap can also still not be that valuable. Uh, whereas something that's expensive might be valuable, but it really depends on the competition. And um, so I would encourage anyone to think about what you're going to get out of the competition, especially if you don't win, because there's only so many people that are lucky enough to win. And, you know, there might be 50 to 100 people every time that might be good enough to have won and might have the right kind of work that might win. But unfortunately, only one person or however many people are lucky enough to win. Um, so if you see a competition and it offers things to you, uh, like, you know, the opportunity to be part of a community or promoting natural values or uh, getting feedback, that kind of thing, that can be really valuable and be a reason why you might pay a certain amount to join a photography competition. And I'd also say, and Paul would know this really well, there's a huge amount of work that goes into these things. Uh, I'm sure Alex and yeah. Tim, you've both put hundreds of hours into running this thing. And I might have even emailed you early on saying, hey, you guys should make sure you pay yourselves because it is a job. Um, and, you know, it, there's this misconception that if you're running a competition, you should be working for free, but, um, and not having benefited from running a competition myself, but I just kind of disagree with that stance. And I think if you run something that provides people with value, then you deserve to be looked after. Yeah, we, we disagree with that too, too, Matt. Um, we, we will be <laughs> paying ourselves for our time next who, year who did, and we'll be... Who decided that it wasn't okay to pay yourselves? That's, that's news to me. <laughs> well, well it, 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 was, it was pretty straightforward, really, Paul. We just wanted to make the competition work. We wanted to make sure that people knew we had the right intentions. Um, we're not going to turn it into some massive profit-making venture, but we literally yeah. cannot afford to put the time in that we have done. Um, I mean, <laughs> right, right here, in fact, I have the awards boxes that I've made, which you will uh, be receiving shortly. Uh, oh, Matt awesome. And Paul. So everybody will receive a set of prints. But this is um, my own book oh, binding. Wow. It's cloth wow. covered. It's archival. Woo. And I I've made the metal piece. 12 of them. And it <laughs> took me the best part of a week to do that. Um, so, you know, and, and, and Tim has been, I mean, the work he's put into making the website and submission system work is ridiculous. I mean, I do a bit of web design myself, so I have a sense of just how complex the coding is. Um, every entrant had, or every entrant who got in that top 30% roughly had um, certificates with judges scores coming back. Well, you think about how hard it is to get that feedback from the judges and turn it into a certificate in, in an automated way so that, mm. um, 
every entrant can can have that feedback. You know, he's creating images using code. So Tim was plowing huge amounts of time into to all that sort of thing. Mm. Um, Matt Payne was the marketing guy. I mean, the number of social media posts across multiple channels, there's no financial gain for him. Either. And, and I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, we spent enough time just chatting on Facebook, quite frankly. I don't speak quite so much to my wife. So um, it's, uh, yeah, hu hugely time consuming. And, and we will have to cover that next year. Um, but we're still hoping to keep the competition uh, the same yeah, as it I is in terms of its ethos. By the end of the show, we might talk about it at the end, you know, like where you feel like the values come back to you personally. Because uh, maybe it might be too early to say at the moment. But going back a little bit on the point Matt was talking about, about value and feedback, to me, I was quite curious and it wasn't really upfront initially, when, even when I entered, about where where the value would come back. If you if you weren't in the top, you know, one or two, is, is that it? And I feel like there's a lot of competitions in the world that, that are they're really present to that and they offering tiers of feedback in terms of either awards or written feedback or other sort of aspects that, that bring value. And one of the things that I didn't expect, that I really appreciated that it sounds like Tim has really done a massive amount of work to create is, is the transparency of the different rounds and the judging scores for every single image. Like that was absolutely brilliant. And I've seen a lot of good feedback um, from a lot of people already about that. And, and I think that's one aspect of value where because I think what really gives people encouragement is say there's six or seven rounds and I don't know how you did that many rounds, but, but it feels like if you've gone a couple of steps down the lane, you're part way up the ladder. Whereas if there's no rungs in between, it's just a winner and nothing else. It feels like this is unattainable stretch to be from where you are up to this top point. And by creating this, these tiers that you have and the transparency of, of every individual image and, and where it got to, I think it's very encouraging. And it's maybe gives a little bit more discernment and feedback for the individual images for for the entrance. So I, I wanted to applaud you for that. I don't know where that yeah, came that, from or, or if you discussed other types of feedback different from that initially or how you settled on that one. Well, that, that was originally looking at the, um, I think the Axon Panel Awards and a few others have uh, bronze, gold, silver certificates. And it didn't seem, it didn't seem to mean anything. Uh, you didn't know what it what it actually meant to be a bronze winner. I don't think in some competitions, at least, anyway. Uh, and we we thought it's 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 important to give some sort of feedback. And I know why some competitions don't give feedback because there was there is that worry that if you tell somebody they were thirteen thousand five hundred out of fourteen thousand, it's not very uh, it doesn't give you much confidence in what you're doing. So there is, there is that that says, well, if we tell people where they got, some people just won't enter again, and then you lost lots of money. But it, it, it doesn't matter, I don't think. I think, it, it, to be honest, allows you to re-enter the following year and see if you've improved or not, or if things have changed. And as long as we're open about it, as long as we can give some feedback, and we've talked about we're going to give some seminars about how judges choose images or rate images, then I think that's the most important thing. Um, and when we came up with these certificates, it was, how do we grade them? Well, there's lots of different options, but why not just tell people what happened and how far they got? Um, we went as far as saying, should we very, actually publish the judges' Tim. scores? But I think actually actually having uh, judges' targets on their heads when they give people zero scores wasn't a good idea. So anonymizing that bit was important still. Yeah, well, if you if you come to Appers, there's no anonymity about the judging. <laughs> there's 150 people in the room watching you and listening to every single thing and be able to play back every word uh, recorded. Oh, I can imagine that's hard at times. <laughs> yeah, it puts you on the spot and it and it really makes you lift your game. I've been doing it for about a decade now, and so has Matt. Um, but I just I also wanted to touch base on how you decided to. I guess, what's the word? What kind of criteria you gave the judges in the judging process and maybe a little bit of insight into what the process was that you're happy to share? And then retrospectively, how you chose the judges and why you chose those particular judges. Alex, do you want to go over the judges and brief? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess starting on, on that last point, I mean, the, the biggest thing for us really was to have a set of judges that were 
for want of a better word, elite landscape photographers, um, the most respected names out there. I mean, we, we're actually discussing changing the judges almost entirely for next year, not because we weren't happy with the judges, but because we think it's healthy to to, to change names and, and so on. But we kind of want to have a, you know, looking into the midterm to have a, a rolling panel, a, a group to select from. And, you know, we were actually talking about who those names would be, the people who we hold in such high esteem that they're almost infallible. And uh, I think you end up with about 20, 20 names that we could all agree on with just these absolute elite of the elite type type people, either because they have a lot of experience with with judging or they're very um, on uh, got their fingers on the pulse with what's happening with current photography. So Alex Noriega might be someone who maybe in 20 years will be an iconic landscape photographer of, of the ages or something, but isn't there at the moment. He's, he's too young. Whereas Joe Cornish, for example, is absolutely at, at that uh, at that level. So yeah, we actually ended ended up with a yeah, fairly yeah. small group of potential names, um, and uh, yeah, just just selected who we thought would be the very best panel for the first year, and um, ev everybody said yes. We didn't get that completely right. I think we, um, you know, there were there were some people who were certainly unhappy with the the diversity of our judging selection. Although that does bring its own complexities, because of course, unfortunately, white men dominate landscape photography. Yeah, um, that was a little bit on my head. Yeah, the, the, there is a battle there if you, if you want to pick these uh, elite of the elite and you, you take your 20 names. Unfortunately, it doesn't represent the world's population um, or and it's not a 50 50 split with women either. Um, but we're, you know, we'll, we'll be working to try and address that as well. well I think um, one of the other things I've learned is just because someone's an incredible photographer it doesn't necessarily mean they're a, a, a terrific judge. Um, yeah, yes. I'll be attested to that quite a bit. It's, it's a certain skill, particularly, say, in our neck of the woods where it's very transparent and verbally spoken, you know, to be able to translate and, and have the visual literacy to really, um, you know, give strength to your arguments to, to honor, you know, what, what's in front of you and, and persuade or, or open others' minds to what they may not have seen is, is quite a skill set. Something Matt's particularly, particularly good at. Um, what's, um, just going back another step, what was the criteria that they were given? How did you sort of, streamline the process and the process itself with the judges i, I think that's something it? that we're actually going to change a little bit for next year um we i mean the key thing we we realized fairly late on actually was in terms of judging selections we really wanted the judges to be able to pick their favorites and not queue up a line of you know average best images that all of the judges scored fairly well because there were some images that were outstanding that were scored one by one judge and then five by another. And actually that might be one of the best images in the competition. So when it came to the final judging, we switched to this system where the judges were advocating for the images that they particularly loved. Mm -hmm. And then the other judges would effectively pick um, or, or talk about those, those images themselves. And then the judge who come up with that initial selection would then pick their favorite so each judge effectively put one image forward to the final voting then so, so that was the system that we we ultimately came up with um but i think we put a lot of trust into our judges to decide what the best photography was and i think broadly that was the right decision to do i mean that's the whole <laughs> purpose of picking these these top photographers um but i think we probably would uh, add a bit more direction in in future years um, just to make sure that the because I, I think the images we have are absolutely outstanding mm -hmm. and I have no quarrel with any of the winners whatsoever. But if you want to represent um, every facet of landscape photography, it may not be the best selection to, to do that. And I think that's where the direction might need to come in. So it needs to come in. So not figuring out, figuring out what's best, but figuring out where these different points are that we need to hit. Um, and I think the Grand Landscape winner was a good example of that. I mean, for me, that was a wonderful Grand Landscape, but we knew when we were selecting it that other people would not see it that way uh, because it is a longer lens image. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I think that, that. that would be, yeah. And, and I think that would be one category where um, we would add a bit more direction next year, but maybe Tim can come in on that. Yeah, you might be able to help us with this one. We've got, we, we want to try and split it, um, the, the grand landscape and intimate, uh, instead of having two categories, have three categories. So there would be a grand scenic, which is the, the really big wide landscapes that we would recognize as sublime views. 
We have the intimate, which would be stuff you can walk around when you're composing it, perhaps. And then in, in the middle is this middle category, and I can't come up with a name for it or define what it is, but I know what it is. Mm. It's what doesn't fit in the other two categories. The picture, yeah. in the picture isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, can, on, Nick, do you have any thoughts about that? I can, I can see uh, just looking at the, at the, I've got the gallery up at the moment, and there was, um, there was one in particular that I looked at and I thought, that's not really an intimate landscape, it's, but it's not really a grand landscape. Exactly. Uh, and I'll probably, I'll probably bring it up when we, we actually get to the, the galleries themselves. Um, and so you're right, I think there is some middle ground somewhere, but on, off the top of my head, I don't know what it's called either. It's, it's a, yeah, a, but definitely Grand Scenic is the right name for the, the type of um, photography that you're talking about, the wider, wider angle or, or, you know, big mountain sort of, um, big Water vista history. sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, yeah and, uh, actually on that on that grand scenic side, one of the things that I found quite interesting about the entrance was I think the way that we positioned ourselves as a competition, the kind of images that we showed on our website and so on, and also the way photography is headed generally led to a disproportionate amount of landscapes that didn't have, say, a crazy sky and a nice foreground shot at 16 millimetres, this kind of epic grand landscape, which is funny because if people say landscape photography, that's probably the style of image that they imagine first. Mm. Um, but, you know, we had 10 times as many images that weren't of that kind of design, if you like. Mm. And, and maybe that's because photographers who pursue that style often edit heavily. I mean, I suppose I might be relatively unusual and, and you too, Nick, in that we uh, don't edit very much at all and, and shoot almost exclusively in, the, in that grand way. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we just didn't have as many entries of, of that style. And so that's something we definitely want to encourage uh, next year. Mm, mm, yeah, I, I think you're, you're right. The, I'm certainly not seeing in the grand landscape the um, that very heavy foreground. Um, yeah. was fo focus stacking was allowed, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so I can't see why you wouldn't have um, particularly vertical um, grand landscapes where you do have the the large foreground element with the mountains in the background. But I think you're, you're absolutely right, Alex, that, that some that really focus on that style um, probably also do a fair bit of perspective blending um, with those to encourage the mountains or yeah, whatever's blending. in the background to be a, a little larger than they would be shot at 16 millimetres. Um, but, um, yeah, it's... You're right, there's definitely a, a room for that, and it should be represented in these photos, but well, um, maybe, maybe not in the American the well, American, American, American style um, of, of that sort of genre, if you know what I mean. Well, we probably yeah, I mean, have anything is the images anyway, so maybe we could bring them up and... Sorry, yeah, I'll just, cut you off I just there, want to quickly, yeah. just before we do, I'll right. just, because um, I agree, it's, it's already quarter past eight, it's time to get, have a start looking at them and putting into four. But Matt, did you have any commentary or reflection on, on what you felt like has come through on these awards and how it maybe separates itself from what's come to the fore in, in terms of a lot of the other competitions in the world? Because I know you're quite privy to a lot of what's out there. Yeah, well, I think um, in terms of what the results have been, uh, in a way they've been a little bit surprising in how much they've rewarded the intimate landscapes, which I think is a good thing. Uh, it feels to me as an entrant and an, an observer as a competition with a different voice and landscape, which is very refreshing. Um, and I think, you know, the, the winners that ended up coming through, um, they weren't your winners that might come through a competition like the Epson Panos or International Landscape. Um, so I, I think it's a great thing and I look forward to seeing what they do next year. Yep. So are you guys planning on staying on? If you weren't, I'll ask yeah, you more. Yeah, I think so. I'll ask yeah. you at the end. So yeah, look, he's onto it. We should, yeah. we should um, let's enjoy sort of having a look at them and because we're already naturally moving in that direction and the images will start speaking for themselves, I think. And the galleries look beautiful, by the way. They're really well, really well set up, gentlemen. What are we starting with, Lukey? All right, we'll start the with back the, end the grand um, landscape, I think. We were start with do. the grand landscape and uh, we'll just... Um, oh, just quickly, in terms of how they're presented, are they in any particular order, guys, or is it just... Yeah. On those ones, yes. I think we got one, two, three, and then highly commended and commended. So it's uh, yeah, right. 
yeah, so there's no there's no like order from one to ten or whatever. Well, I guess these these are higher than these three. Yeah, so just a little. I mean, there's just there's a little no bit of differentiation the, there. Just Com tiering. Yeah. In terms of the commendations, they're not in any order. It's just a. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Cool. Okay. I mean, in many ways, the judging was so close that it's kind of academic which, which yeah. came ninth and which came yeah. tenth. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. So are we going to speak for each image or, or, or what? I mean, have we, well, have we run out of time? I think a little bit of both. Quickly? I think we won't have time to go through every single image to speak to it. So I, my feeling, and if anyone feels differently, say let, let the conversation flow and weave in and around the images maybe. Yeah, um, one of the things I wanted to say about the, 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 the grand scenics was that uh, many, many of the entries that had that vertical format, foreground and background, were, were, were really sort of forced, quite brutal. You know, you take take a subject and put it in the foreground and it fills the whole frame as a single subject, no offset, no balance, no interesting connection between foreground and background. Um, and, and I think that was possibly why a lot of those didn't get past the uh, earlier stages mm. or not, well, early stage, you got, a lot of them got thrown to the judges to, to rate, but I don't think the judges got excited about them. Um, Partly, partly, I think, because they are very difficult to do well, perhaps. Mm. This, this image was interesting because the judges were a bit polarised on it, actually. There were a few who said that the, the mist in, in the centre um, sort of drew the eye. It was this empty space in, in the middle of the frame. And then there was a majority of judges who disagreed with that and, and felt that it, it was a really atmospheric uh, and unusual image. This is actually the, the Drakensberg. This mm. is... Um, yeah, the in many pinnacles so it's not hard yeah it's, it's a hard a place to get to line, yeah. had quite a voice that part of the world in this competition didn't it? it like, did yeah which was really exciting for me actually to see although i kind of wished i could have entered my own dragons <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can't so don't <laughs> yeah i'm gonna change my name <laughs> next all right yeah i mean to me that that there's you can just imagine you know somebody from 500 px genre just going to town or something like this and to see it kind of left to its own subtlety and in terms of the color tone and, and density and saturation this yeah just like a like a fresh quiet breeze i feel like with and that quite surprised me with a lot of the images it's doing a lot of judging it's it's not that often you see large quantities of of really quite subtly handled work yeah. Um, given, yeah, I mean, this know, feels just voice. brutally literal, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, it's just got that feeling of exactly how you would, yeah. you know, literally relate to it, uh, which I guess is the point, really. And, yeah. And just yeah, that's, that's on a big point. I think it's it's a connection with landscape is what I'm I'm more interested in. It's an experience. I think um, if if it doesn't if it doesn't make me feel something about what I'm looking at, as if I could be there and experience the same thing, it it doesn't have that connection for me. Mm. Um, and Eric, Eric Bennett is a, is is a particular. I did a review of his book. I think last couple of weeks ago, maybe or I don't know, maybe a bit old, but further back. And he he's, he's got his printed book. But he also has a digital book that is about a single trip out. And the whole whole ebook is from this one trip. And this is a uh, an image from that book. And it was great because I, I I got a feeling that I was alongside him while I'm looking at this book. And that's mm. that's a feeling that I. I don't guess. Often I look at photographs and I get this sublime sense of it isn't that beautiful, but sometimes there's no connection. As a kicker, I just had a thought, Tim, like um, an image like that makes you feel like you're physically standing alongside, whereas I guess another way to look at it when when you have, you know, quite creatively processed work is, is you're more like sitting inside their mind as opposed to standing next to them in the landscape. So you're, often, coming, yeah. you're coming along with them in a, in a, in a different aspect. Uh, it's probably if, just if you can combine those two together, that's that's what makes a perfect photograph, mm. a bit of both. Yeah, again, beautiful atmospherics here and where the light handle, the tonal range handle, it's got a lot of physical depth and breadth and breathing room and space and, and that mirroring of the, the highlights top and bottom just to bring you up and down the frame and up and down the frame constantly. I, I really appreciate that. I think that would look absolutely amazing printed large, actually, that particular shot. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yep. Great. Where is it? I wonder. Uh, I can't, can't remember, actually. Um, I think we, we we discussed that, but yeah, I can't, I can't remember what was said. No. 
it was interesting. I, I thought the judges wouldn't uh, wouldn't go for this one. It's in the early rounds, but it was quite a unanimously liked image. I don't think not many people chose it as a favourite, but it was uh, it, it was up there. And I think again, it's to do with this feeling. It's it's I, I've been out in conditions like that, isn't? And it is a spectacular feeling of uh, a sense of stillness that you mm. get from images like this. Yeah, it, this is probably a good um, good point to discuss trees in the mist as well, because if, if you're thinking of entering next year, we did have a lot of trees in the mist images. Oh, damn, and, that's uh, all mine, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you, that's why I didn't enter this year. <laughs> so I, <laughs> yeah, when you're, when you're looking at 14,000 images and, you know, 500 of them are trees in, in the mist shots, of course you try and select the best ones, but there's a lot of best... Uh, trees in in the mist shots, and um, so I, I would say if you if you shoot in that way, you have to be very selective over what you present because, of course, we love those shots. But if there's a lot of them that are entered, it's uh, it's increasingly difficult to make yours stand out. Mm. We'll, we'll we'll have to encourage this episode for uh, all the entrants next year so they can get all the tips. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, you, <laughs> that is absolutely stunning, isn't it? Mm. The set lights, yeah, it's sweeping it's lines. The shadows um, streaking yep. along as well. And the... Yeah, and the way that they sort of interact with those, um, the lines on the snow there, um, mm. sort of a, a crosshatch sort of pattern. It's beautiful. It really yeah, and the way, way the, the physicality of the foreground on the left kind of mirrors the exact same sort of angular features of, of the shadows, which is a really mm. subtle kind of repetition. Um, to me, it's an incredible image on its own just in, in the bottom half. And yet when you introduce that, that upper kind of realm, it gives it this huge amount of depth that wouldn't exist otherwise that all of a sudden just you know ties back in with those cooler tones on the on the foreground and and, and in the background as well it, it sort of really rounds it out mm. and the it's simplicity nice of that the... two-tone kind of color palette too yeah. it's nice they yeah. didn't remove the cast either you could have easily wanted to push that a bit wider or something like that and just leaving that those beautiful tones come through yeah. On the yeah. uh, on the critique side, one of the judges actually picked up on uh, the left hand side of the image there, the shadowed area and that edge, that sort of corner that you get on the left hand side of the frame in in the shadow of the snow. So uh, sort of on the left hand side in in the middle there. Um, so that was you know every image that we went through was critiqued one way or another by the judges, and and that should really be part of our process. Um, I mean, as as judges, but also as photographers. Um, so, it, you know, it's probably worth saying that everybody's images had had a critique, whether they were good or bad or great or terrible or. Um, and yeah, obviously, most of the judges disagreed with that point of critique as well. Mm. So Alex, just to clarify, like at what stage of the process were the judges collectively speaking to images as opposed to individually? Was it whole, was a whole process collective or was it? Just just the final like round. The so yeah, we had a five hour judging session. That was all the time we could get with all of the judges together. And that was, I was when I was gonna say with that volume um, of work would be almost impossible to I think we yeah, had because it, I mean, 20 images on that final uh session, five hour session. Mm. Yeah, having done a lot of live judging, <laughs> I've got an idea what time it takes. Interestingly, what, this what, this picture here in contrast to that first image of the uh, Drakensberg that had a really polarized um, view from the judges this was a fairly unanimous one uh, well, it didn't it didn't score as well as the other one by individual judges one person picked it as their favorite mm. but they all scored it reasonably highly so mm. I, I, I ran a few st stats on uh, the scorings that came back from those earlier rounds and, it, and you could look at the ones that were most polarizing, the ones that were least polarizing, and it's quite interesting to see which it's, ones got through. Yeah, this this one, the the, the bottom left uh, white is is mirrored with the the top right uh, almost black um, in darkness, and then you're led through uh, with your eye beautifully through that um, that very grand canyon lands there uh, through to that dark part, and it, it just it, flows really nicely and then yeah it's almost like a yin and yang um sort of balance yeah. if you know what i mean i think that's what i'm seeing there that's what yeah, a couple I mean, of the judges said yin and yang yeah, yeah right yeah two, two aspects back. for me that are probably a little bit challenged by is that large area of negative space on the central left that doesn't offer a lot of detail there's enough in there that can give you some purpose of coming in closer and and also i guess the way that the top left corner is kind of cut off a little bit uh, relative to giving a, a nice 
kind of clean slide into into the frame, but that would sort of change the composition, obviously. If you I think it, I think it might well have done better had it had more more texture in that in that mm. white on the left yeah. side. I mean, we're just kind of lucky that dappled light and shadow on the bottom right really really gives it a bit of extra presence rather than just being a, a big sort of flat plane of light, mm. relatively speaking to all the intricate details in the, in the rest of the scene, because it is quite a significant part of the image. Oh, again, Lukey, that, that kind of, um, that coloration you were talking about, you know, they, they haven't sort of stripped it away or. Yeah, just keeping that, like it'd be, you, you feel like you could, might need to correct that slightly, but it's, it's probably very similar to what came out of camera, if that's what you're referring to, Paul. How many how many images were filmed, Tim? Um, I think. Well, I, I won't know. I don't know apart from I think the final one thousand, maybe. Yeah, about eight hundred. I think we had raw files for, and out of those, I would say forty film photographs. Yep. So a reasonable number. Most um, of those were Ben Horns, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most of those Ben Horns. <laughs> Although so we're saying that it's going to come on at some stage too, so I look forward to that. Oh wow! That's yeah, awesome. but it was quite interesting when we asked for the raw files how to verify them. Obviously, I think the wildlife photographer of the year used to ask people to send their film over to them to verify. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, <laughs> it doesn't get lost in the mail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I run, I run a drone scanning service, and that worries me all the time. <laughs> Matt's Matt's the only other person I know that's had to vet huge amounts of raw files. <laughs> Do you have anything to yeah. say about that, Matt? Oh, it's a pretty intensive process, isn't it? Um, Very much one so. thing I would say is anyone entering a competition that has a, a um, time in which the photograph has to be taken, make sure you set up your metadata on your camera properly. Yeah. Because, uh, we do see people run out with a new camera and then uh, enter the image, and then it's got the um, camera oh, default no. date on the file. Uh, gotcha. Uh, bugger. Yep. But there's a bit of something you can what, do. Where was the cutoff point for asking for roars in, in terms of the, this competition? Um, it, it was the basically anything that got shown to the judges and scored by the judges had to have a raw file ready. Um, and so we, we asked for those. I think it was about three, three or four weeks because we had to go through the first um, splits to try and work out what we were going to pass through to the judges. So I think we might extend the judging period because it was quite compressed, trying to fit everything in. Yeah, it um, sounds like it for the volume we're going through. But for the film yeah, photographs, sure. like I, I got asked for I think twelve raw files, but I wasn't sure what that meant about what stage it was at, and, and it wasn't sort of clear to me. But yeah, I mean that that would last ten percent. Got raw file checked, I think. I, I think just just quickly going back to that last image, that's maybe another point to pick up on for other people enter, entering. Um, I think a lot of photographers here would be tempted to do one of three things. Correct the color cast by removing the, the blue, um, add saturation to enhance the color or add contrast to stop it looking flat. And I think if you do any of those things, you lose the subtlety of the color and the atmospheric quality of it yeah and, and even cropping cropping the sky out would be another thing people might do and i, I think yeah. not doing all of those things is is the right choice here and i think really paying attention to the quality of color is is very important particularly if you're trying to uh, impress the best landscape photographers in the world <laughs> mm -hmm. who, who are quite privy to know you know how authentic that coloration is in the moment more that one there is pretty spot on. Probably, I think mm. extremely authentic. Yeah. Mm. This is third place. Well, it's pretty grand, isn't it? it doesn't mm. get much grander than that. That's just <laughs> yeah. yeah, stunning. It's funny. Yeah, I mean, the that... quality of water. It almost seems like snow or something. You know, the way water and mist and air is 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 kind of fluidly combined through this image. You know that one almost flows into the other and yet they're actually quite different substrates, but somehow in this image, they, they blend into, into one uniform. It's like that waterfall actually is, is a waterfall of mist that's just washed yeah. through the rest of the frame. And it's a very unusual quality, I think, to this image. And the black and white really lends to that too, then too. You don't have the color to distract away from, from the fact of those two things melding together, I suppose, as well. Yeah, you, you yeah. get a lot more separation in terms of that conceptually, wouldn't you, if it's mm. color? There were quite a few conversations image? about the fact this was Yosemite and it's uh, you know a very accessible place to photograph. Some people were were saying that it's a little bit too easy to get photographs like this, 
because of its location and some people were saying that shouldn't matter at all so that was quite yeah, a bit of I, wreck. It, that'd be a bit controversial to introduce that as a criteria really wouldn't it because mm. uh, I guess you know to, to people you know like Alex in particular and, and Luke that you know, and, and Nick, they've put in really hard yards to get really places that few people get to, you know, you get, you, it almost imbues the image with more value to you personally. We don't necessarily make it a better image. And, yeah. and that's one of the big issues personally, when you put your work into, into competitions, you've got to remove yourself somehow, be a little bit more objective about your own work. Mm. Because if you put so much blood, sweat and tears into it, you, you get a little bit lost. Uh, and emotionally. Yeah, you, you can't make it a criteria, but at the same time, iconic shots composed in iconic ways with spectacular aurora or something over the top did terribly with the judges and and that's because you have to be able to show creativity and 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 this image shows that that you've got that idea of the water turning into mist and so it elevates the image past the iconic location um but yeah for people who entered images that were almost cookie cutter unfortunately they they didn't do so well with the judges for that reason mm. Interesting. Yeah, which should be quite different than a lot of other competitions, I imagine. Second place, runner up. I can't yeah. recognize where that is. Um, looks like it's the US. North of Capital. Yeah, it's Capital. definitely the, oh, the yeah. US. I, I don't know. Is it Utah, Tim? Yeah, I think it's Some... like Northern Utah. I I think Frank Vitale's actually... home. Yeah. What's that? I think I've actually stood here. I feel like I have. I'm very close to it. It's probably maybe north of Capitol Reef, maybe. Um, you, you sort of. You can actually see this as you're driving along the distance. And if you do the dodgy and go down a few different roads that you're probably not meant to go down and walk over the hill, you, you get this scene. And um, I might be wrong, but it was, um, I've got something almost exactly the same. But I remember when I was shooting it, I was waiting for that dramatic sort of late light to, you know, blast out those those hills and give them sort of depth and separation. And, and here it's, it's almost like the softness that's the hero. Mm. I, I, yeah. This is an interesting one. For me as a judge, because I, when it, when this came through in the early rounds, I didn't give it a really high score because I I thought it had been overprocessed a little bit. Um, fortunately, it got enough score to get through because when we actually got the raw file for it, it was almost bang on. Oh, I was, was going to say I haven't been in that all. area. It's pretty bang on. <laughs> yeah, sure. quite remarkable. Wow. Yeah, interesting. What what gave you, what made you think it was overprocessed, Tim? I don't know. So it's, it's the the pink uh, is more intense than I expected um, yeah. with the light, I think. This is just a really, this is done a long time after sunset or a long way before sunrise, I think, and it's just that got very that, flat. That, yeah. that quality that you get of light um, at that time of day, I think, and uh, and just... Yeah, I, I can I can see it being fairly natural. Did, did you look at the raw particularly? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I opened, I opened the raw, and I presumed it already got all the all the uh, all the settings applied to it, but it yeah. hadn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, it was yeah. obviously flatter than this. Yeah, and the yeah, I yeah. think the background re receded a little bit in contrast, so that the background contrast had been boosted a little bit, not much at all though. Mm. And for me, this this was an interesting one in terms of why the competition is important, because when I see a photograph like this. With the competition at, at the background saying it's been checked, I trust that it's representative. Mm. Whereas before now, I would have looked at it and gone, well, you know, it's, that's obviously over-processed. You don't get scenes that, yeah, that colourful. You kind of just relax into the image to, without, without having that other part yeah. of your mind. Again. And, and that, that, Tim, is unfortunately a bit of a travesty of the current scene of photography where you look at something that is actually like this is presented, pretty much natural, and we assume it's over-processed because we're so used to over-processing. And um, I think that's one of the, the real drawbacks of, of the, you know, the last um, sort of 10 years of landscape photography. It's actually injected that into our psych, um, yeah. psyche. And, um, yeah. It's, a parallel it's, it's, world, it's, it's coming it? back around. I think it was coming back around before we started the competition. So in a way, the competition's well timed because it's almost yeah. riding, riding that wave. <laughs> sort of as like you and me, who've tried to just be straight laced the whole time. Mm. We're finally getting our day in the sun. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think you're right. Um, I think you're right, Alex. Yeah, it's, 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 it's good to see. Yeah. Where do you um, feel like not to uh, take away from this amazing image, but where do you feel like that movement is sort of 
steeped in. I mean, to me, like the, and I was talking to Nick about it before the show, the, the British and European photographers and English photographers are and long renowned for, you know, a, a sort of fierce authenticity to the landscape in, in a lot of ways um, by design or otherwise or tradition. And, and, you know, and obviously, you know, you guys are, are in the fora of pulling this competition together. And, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the American sort of based imagery is moving the other direction. Um, so where, where do you feel like things are heading and, and, and is this kind of competition sitting in a divide in a way, like do you think in terms of- I, I think the, the reason that you see a little less of it now than maybe you did a year or two years ago is just that people have got bored of it. Um, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't draw the likes. It doesn't, I mean, it's, it was a social media fed phenomenon in, in, in the first place. I mean, of course, everybody wants to, uh, you know, potentially amaze the, the viewer, but mm. um, social media just rocket fueled that, uh, that thought process. And then when everybody started copying these fantastical st styles, it became ordinary again. And, and so then people have to drift in, in other directions. And I think that's part of the reason why you see less of the like classic grand landscape is because people are bored of it. People are bored of shots into the sun, ultra wide views and, and all that kind of thing. So you'll always see this shift in, in any art form. Um, as, as styles change slightly, which is why it's so important to have your own genuine idea of how you want to present your work and then stick to that regardless of what's happening around you. Yeah, absolutely. Stick with what you want to do. And how yeah, like, if when you need either of you guys back on the show, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to sort of explore a little bit further, particularly that, that kind of British, British sort of aspect of culture that, that seems to come through with, with people like Joe. Um, so we yeah, should I mean, really speak to this image as well. It's right in front of us. <laughs> well, um, sorry, Alex, you were going to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to say the UK photography community just didn't wouldn't tolerate that kind of editing because we've grown up on uh, Joe Cornish and David Ward and Charlie Waite and so on. And they're film photographers who've never delved into that kind of editing. So uh, whereas I, I think the American aesthetic tradition is, you know, more more based around both the painters and Tim's talked with me about the Hudson River School before um, and also the colour work of people like Galen Rowell who created these incredible fantastical landscapes so there's a slightly different aesthetic basis there yeah. and maybe the same in Australia too with with some of your iconic photographers yeah. uh, but we don't yeah. have that here we've always had understated work held in, in the highest I sort of feel like Tasmania probably has that um, aspect from the Dombrovskis and Trakanis and yeah, that kind of thing definitely. more of a yeah straight yeah, shooting do. style yeah yeah that's very true i think it's also it, it probably the actual landscape itself would dictate to a degree when we're talking if we, we're thinking british british landscapes in general are far more understated than than the you know the, the i mean obviously they're beautiful but the, they're understated compared to the the wow factor of some landscapes particularly in the united states and, and other areas similar in the world and and that may have some influence as well but you, you know you think about someone like guy guy Tao, for example who's um very much that, that more subtle um thing in that grand landscape and, and and that doesn't ring as true so you can't be generalist about it of course but um yeah the actual landscape itself may be influencing how the work's been created yeah, that's really fair. And that's interesting about this image here. So so it's the winner of the grand landscape and yet it's, you know, a, a, mid, a mid range will be on telephoto shop potentially. But if you'd been to that place and you'd know El Cap or you've been anywhere near it, it just emanates grandeur by its very nature of what mm. it is. Mm. It's absolutely yeah. immense. And, and even though it comes, it only comes through more subtly here, but it's still, it's quiet voices louder in some ways as a result, I think. I mean, I, I think this is the whole judging direction thing. We created uh, a category which allowed for this style of image. Um, and for me, it's absolutely grand. It 100% meets that description. Yep. We never said wide angle and must contain a sky or anything like yeah. that. Um, yeah. And I think this is a, a great selection by the judges. It was discussed at length um, whether this was what, the category had uh, you know deserved if you like in terms of the actual style of the image as opposed to its quality um but everybody agreed that it was it was certainly very grand mm. no it's beautiful mm. any, any, other, on. any other points of note of this one and then we'll probably need it if we want to go through more images we'll probably have to speed up the process a little bit but yeah that's not too bad at the same time at the, the valleys in the conversation um 
more than anything because people can look at the images in their own time to some extent. Um, I oh, can move forward. I was just curious if there's any any other conversation about that one. But the only the only thing about that one that of note was a few people said, "Well, it's taken from the car park." Um, but in actual fact, having lined up some of the shots and seen it, so. it's uh, Michael Fry's gone climbed quite up up the hill in the background mm. to try and get an alternative angle. And it is it, it's subtly different, but it is different. It exposes more of the waterfall. Um, so. Interesting this to have a couple judges that are knowledgeable enough to know to know where shots are taken from. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It would be like that if it was in Tasmania. So I guess if you know the area well, it's, yeah. 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 All right. Intimate and abstract. We'll go to the commended. Matt, you've been right. a bit quiet there. Feel free to pipe in anything you, you want to say about any images. You, you, this is one of your, your great areas as well, my friend. Yeah, thanks. I think this is a really clever, unique image, um, and it works really well because of the separation on that little leaf on the centre line there. Had that been yeah. overlapping all of the other green leaves, I think it could have looked a little bit messy, but a really well-seen image with um, some beautiful light that's been identified there. Yeah, yeah and creating, you know, like a like a mini mountainscape. Mm. You know, symbolically this is really quite striking it's one of the first mm. it almost looks like a setup right as well it looks like a studio shot where somebody's layered branches or something it's almost too perfect mm. But, mm. Uh, exactly you know. i sort of feel too the attraction might be to recover the shadows a little bit or put a bit of texture in there but by leaving it dark yeah. it obviously it just creates that awesome contrast yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, li I'd like to see a little bit in the shadow there yeah <laughs> Yeah. Just, just, just to prove it's that, that, just that it is there, that it's separated. Yeah. It is there. I mean, that, that's one aspect of judge of criteria we use over here is we, you've got, you, I mean, you, you're rewarded for a deliberateness of, of pushing the contrast far enough to create impact, but at the same time, it needs to give a sense of the deliberateness and controlled choice around mm. that and understanding of exposure as well. Um, as well. So it seems like a deliberate decision rather than, you know, maybe a mistake or a. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I should add to that one of the, one of the things we've, we did with the judging that was very conscious was to not do judging in the early rounds uh, and, and remote judging using a web-based judging system. Uh, I've, I've used a web-based judging system in the past and it doesn't allow you any flexibility to go back and review your choices and reorder them uh, and quickly edit them, tag them. And I was very committed to wanting to do those judging processes in Lightroom to allow people to use a tool that's built for the job yeah. And so we went through um, quite a bit of work to try and make that happen so yeah, that right. you can go in, review them quickly, get rid of some, reorder them. Um, and, and I think that allows you to go back and reassess your choices, which is really important because the way you see images changes the second and third viewing. What was the pixel size that the judges were looking at? To? We got 3,000 pixel on the long edge. Oh, that's plenty. Yeah, because yeah. some some competitions are like, oh, a thousand's fine. I'm like, yo, you got to be joking. No, you can never judge. Can't zoom in at all. You, you got no idea what's going on. Yeah. Jeez. Mm. Yeah. I can, just, I can just melt into this image somehow. <laughs> Mm. Again, this this was a sort of genre of image that was very hard to do well in because there were a lot of rock abstracts. Yep. And I mean, if you look at this one, there's this almost like perfect scattered texture and this incredible variety of colors that all fit together into this perfect pastel color palette. So it's this like absolute dream version of, of this shot because we had so many rock abstracts to choose from. Mm. So the standard for that style of image, again, is stratospherically high. Yeah. Mm. Well, this is this is an interesting choice. It's it's quite uh, there's there's no real darks in this image or, or very dark um, uh, tones at all. It's it's quite bright. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's we've had a few people since then saying that can't be real. It looks fake. Um, and you go back to the raw file, and it's yeah, it's increased saturation a bit but not much done to it beyond that. Mm. And it'd be very tempting to try and push the blacks down to try and create some separation in there mm -hmm. and to recover those highlights to bring some texture back. I think it's it creates a mood without that. Mm. Well, one yeah. of the uh, in interesting things for me were there are a lot of sort of perfect versions of this style of scene, okay? So every single aspen tree is vertical and evenly spaced and so on. 
and it, it did leave the those images feeling a bit sterile compared to these sort of more organic versions of, of the same scene so again you kind of saw the judges filter out those to a large extent and we ended up with seemingly ran more random photographs but maybe which were more engaging as a result mm. i know um joe cornish in particular he actually likes imperfection in images because he sees it as like a doorway into an image being genuine can i jump in um uh, in a metaphorical sense i was watching a video about auto-tune and um, kind of tweaking things to hit the, the exact notes uh, and i see this as one of those kinds of images and the takeaway was that if you're not exactly hitting on the note, it's a, a much more human tone. Yeah. And I feel like this image has a lot more humanity and nature to it for its imperfections and not being all lined up, which is probably... It wasn't what... a Freddie Mercury video by any chance, was it? It was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was oh, yeah. that was very, yeah. very well said, Matt, and rings true for yeah. me because I absolutely yeah. hate auto-tune being a singer. Uh, <laughs> I think it's the worst invention in the world, but um, I'm sure people would love to debate that. But you're absolutely right. The imperfection of voice is what makes the tone, what makes the richness, and, and it translates beautifully, as you've said, um, to this type of image. That's intriguing, isn't it? Oh, mm. mysterious, isn't it? It's obviously... Not a great, water not a great deal of black and white in a competition, but... Some really good. Yeah, entries. I was curious about that. Like, um, are you going to have like a? Have you considered having a, a category for it? Or, well, I think I think an award. One of the things we want to do is not split up the categories too much with um, okay. with with boundaries. Mm -hmm. We may well have a, a a set of awards, almost like the founders awards for biomes, mm -hmm. uh, that might recognise that. Biomes, yeah. Uh, and that that'll definitely be in the book. I think. What do you think, Alex? Mm -hmm. What this image? No, I mean black and white as a an award or a category or maybe let's discuss it offline, Tim, rather than committing ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean I don't I don't like the idea of it as a category on its own. Um yeah. because it's... I, I think black and white absolutely stands up to colour photography when it's it's done really well, which yeah. it should be. Um yeah. Yeah, th th this photo is a good example of our judging process catching something actually because in pre-judging I think I gave this I don't know zero or one um it did absolutely nothing for me uh I was looking through 14,000 images and uh, we all made mistakes as as pre through through that pre-judging process but uh the other three scored scored it well and then I looked at it again and I thought why did I you know not score score this higher um because it's got that really great mysterious almost spooky quality to it mm. it's amazing I've, I've watched a lot of judging processes and i've learned a lot from people like paul and and matt in particular talking about images and it's it's amazing hearing a live panel of judges talk about an image and have one judge score it without knowing what the other judges are going to score and having that one judge that's either really really high or really really low and then having the other judges uh, sort of talk about the image and then that judge that, particularly when they're low, um, coming up and, and, and seeing the merit of the image based on, on you know, when it's actually talked to. And, um, and yeah, that's probably a, a, a good example of a similar sort of thing that you've been through with this, Alex. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just also subjective, isn't it? I mean, that's the thing with competitions. You're yeah. trying to find the best photographer, but the subjectivity puts a lot of luck effectively into the equation. I mean, yeah, you can imagine... I would see this as a very, sub very subjectively appealing image. You know, it really... It's, there's a lot of subtlety and intricacy here and, and mystery that, that isn't very apparent up front necessarily. And you need mm -hmm. to honour it with a bit of time or open your mind a little bit more. And, and in that regard, it's, it's almost a risky image to put it in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I really appreciate that it's been seen. Yeah. Well, this looks like something Matt would do. Yeah, I, actually, um, this was probably one of my picks out of this category, I think. Yeah. Uh, it's just so beautifully seen. And to document the behavior of the landscape in such a subtle way, along with the almost like a graphic design aspect of it as well. Uh, I think it's a fantastic image. So, so is it speaking to the movement of the different wind directions and, and the scraping of the, the of it to create that shape? Is it? Mm. That's yeah, so you can see, you actually see that in a lot of, of dune 
landscapes you, you do see generally an arc not a perfect circle so i've never seen a perfect circle like that but certainly if you oh, hunt around sand dunes you can find those patterns fairly commonly just i've never seen a perfect circle mm. it's nice in the it must be like a black volcanic sand too yeah. or something yeah it must, it must be in iceland yeah, must yeah. and then I also think... to have done a long exposure so you can see the movement in the grass rather than freezing that so it's sort of almost indicating how the circle was formed as well by yeah, including well said, that yeah. movement yeah <laughs> beautiful if you want to see another one, you can go to my Instagram, Alex. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You've been to Iceland, sorry. have you, Dick? Sorry? You've been to Iceland recently, have you? No, 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 but it's a, it's a full circle, exactly the same sort of thing, but right top down. Uh, but no, no black sand, a bit more subtly than that uh, graphic one, yeah. Yeah, what I meant to say was I've only seen one good one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, touche, touche. <laughs> um, the corner has been laid down there, gentlemen. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Well done, well done. Um, this this image was the one I was talking about earlier when you were talking about Tim the um, whether it fits in a grand landscape or whether it fits in an intimate. Now, this one to me, it you know, it, there are, there's obviously some intimacy to it, but it, it's not to me. It, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> I do know exactly what you mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this was the one that stood out as not being particularly intimate in what was in my head about what intimate means. Tim, did we actually move a lot of woodland grand. shots? There. I think we might have actually moved this from grand into intimate, didn't we? Was this we did indeed. Yeah. yeah, well, there, we, there oh, you go. So it was actually entered in grand. And, and one thing that we said to entrance was if we felt your image would do better in a different category, we would move it. And that's what we did here. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this, this was that's a controversial just one just because of the whole Cypress swampland issue. Mm. It's, um, it's, it just has this utter sense of mastery about, about yeah. the lightness and, and that, you know, that a Rembrandt painter would be proud of. It's, mm. that's just dripping through the screen here. It just, it just couldn't be more beautifully handled, I don't think, by, mm. by God, nature, the photographer, or, other, or the combination of all three. Mm. Mm. All right, Tim, were you saying... Um, Essentially, that that's an invasive species that's been documented. No, no, it, it was it was to do with the cypress um, trees in the swamp becoming a, a meme in competitions. Oh, so yes. many. Of them. Yes. I know. Um, yeah, especially in the in the states. Oh my goodness. Mm. Yeah, but this this transcended that. I think for mm. most most photographers, it, this becomes more like street photography than landscape photography. And there's uh, people talked about them as figures mm. uh, dancing. Yeah. Can you, can you elaborate on what you mean by that term, street photography? Well, a lot. I've, I've written an article in the past on on landscape about how to approach tree photography, um, and I, I particularly just think of the figurative nature of the trees and how they how they're balanced, how they're posed, uh, and how they interact with each other as a form of street photography, mm. or or dance photography, or whichever way you want to look at it. But it's definitely as a Thinking of them as humans interacting. Yeah, it's a really interesting take, Tim. That's yeah, yeah, really interesting. Might, might um, yeah, influence how you see the scene differently when you're out there. Yeah, it's, mm. yeah. it's just yeah. sheer emotion. It's quite a dramatic power. image I've seen in the whole competition. I think so far, yeah. like it's, it's just it's, it's screaming with 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 loudness relative to the softer voices of a lot of the other images to me. Um, yeah, and, 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 it, and what is it? I mean, there's a lot of intrigue. Is it under the water or is it a an avalanche of snow? Wave or crashing. Yeah. Wave crashing? Is it, yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, you can move in different directions with it. That's, that's, its, that's its majesty, I think. Mm. Yeah, I actually don't know the answer to that. Is it snow, Tim? Uh, I haven't got a clue. It looks like <laughs> oh, snow to me. I read, I read I, it as yeah. not so, to be honest. It's got and, something solid to it. Yeah, to enjoy that, that multitude of, of interpretation. It's... Yeah, and the we fact we don't know, yeah, is good, a great right? Strength to me. Yeah, absolutely. Is it? Uh, would it be a monochrome conversion to get the blue there, or is it? A, that would have been more natural in terms of. Uh, I think it's fairly natural if I remember right. Yeah, right. Wow. Well. I might have to have a quick check now. Yeah. It's just other words. It's just such an otherworldly quality about it as well. Almost see some faces in there too. If you get too too far looking into it so yeah, yeah. you can almost see like hands reaching forwards out of out of those sort of features as well you know yes yeah yeah, yeah interesting. Interesting. you can spend a lot of time in there can't you mm. oh. 
so we can't. <laughs> um, <Not tonight. laughs> so, yeah, this is the third place. Yeah, I mean, you can actually say a lot about this image, and the judges did. This is one of Joe Cornish's picks, actually. Um, and uh, there's that angularity of the rock behind that is echoed in in the trees. This tree sort of fit around that V, but also that foreground tree has that very strong diagonal to it as well. So it sort of really beautifully fits together when we have had all of these tree intimate images, lots in this kind of style, even with this kind of palette. Um, but I think this one really stood out, but it wasn't unanimous uh, among the judges. Some of them had very keen eyes for, for detail and didn't like, for example, the detail towards the top right. You've got this extra crack coming in that one of the judges felt was slightly distracting. Another felt that a crop from the left would have helped to make it more balanced. And then others liked it because it was slightly imbalanced and hadn't even noticed the imperfections. So there was just a huge variety of, of opinion on, on this. And, and that was the benefit of having that discussion is that the, the judges who you know decided there were some distractions were maybe I think talked round by those who felt that was one of the strengths of their photo. Yeah, I could see that being quite a polarizing image on, on a panel actually, for, for lots of reasons. Runner up. Oh, Mr. Freestone. Yep. Very good. We've, we had him on the Friend show, of the show. a year ago too. Mm. He's, his, his work's been um, really transcending in the last year or two. He's really, really mm. going great guns. He, he showed us this image too, I think. Mm, on the show, did, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, tonality, absolutely gorgeous. Mm. And Jeff's doing so well in the last few years with these uh, intimate landscapes he's capturing. Mm. Uh, but this one is pretty masterful. And it's amazing just how he's managed to get what he has out of something that is so complicated. Mm, and it so all, comes down, all comes down to the, the, the way the tones work in the image and um, uh, to, to bring something out of such a complicated, you know, sort of twist of, of branches. Well, it's, it's that masterful, subtle separation of the, the blue tones which naturally move forward cognitively and the blue tones which pull you back and it creates that three-dimensional sort of separation that wouldn't exist without that really beautiful handling of the color. Mm. So sort of I, I don't actually, I don't actually know Jeff's approach, but for me, I look at a photo like this and I think this is somebody who probably experiments and fails a lot as, as part of their creative process, because I think, you know, ultimately this is a pretty mundane subject that anybody would walk past. Right. And, and that's the point you need to photograph. You need to see that potential and keep trying and trying and failing and failing and then recognize when you've when you've struck gold, so to speak, because, yeah, mm. I mean, it's just such a spooky image, but the, the structure is amazing, too. And particularly if you look at it as a thumbnail, it, it, it looks you can see the structure of the image in, the, in that tiny form. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's a really interesting photo for me. Mm. Yeah, it handles scale really well, this image, doesn't it? It's yeah, small definitely. Grand, you can appreciate it just the same. And it would be tech sharp, too, knowing know, just work as well. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, surely that's a pain. My tongue started one started wanting to lick up the screen. On this one. It was just delicious. <laughs> that's the winner, obviously. Mm. Absolutely delicious. Uh, well, what was her name again? The artist, just with Frank Gabler. Yeah, yeah. I really need to. Uh, she reached out and said, "Get out the other day. I'd like to um, engage with her in her work and how she sees." Mm. Yeah, put a few hours aside, Paul. Oh, that I just had a cool. glance at her website and. Whew. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. Some people I mean, are complaining we're, we're, about all the professional photographers winning, and uh, we had to point out that she's got a full time job. Mm. Yeah, I yeah. guess the, 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 there must have been a conversation about that professional versus non professional. Somewhere along the line, and you were teeing this up. Where, where did you settle on in the end? Yeah, we recently put a post on um, Facebook about it. We, we had a a discussion it didn't, didn't really come up originally it didn't it was obvious that it, there isn't really a, a differentiator in many ways it is about the images and i think i know many amateur photographers that are way better than most professional photographers it, it doesn't seem to make a huge difference so we, we we didn't address it and then as people complained about it we looked at it and thought well should we address it our conclusion was no i don't think it's a good idea but we put it out to the public 
Um, you can imagine how far that. you could take take it though, because you know, let's say traveling gives you an advantage to go to some of these amazing spaces. So money is is a feature. And then time is definitely a feature. So you don't want other commitments. So probably what we should do is penalize rich retired people. You know, I mean <laughs> it is just it'd just be ridiculous. Oh, that's and if, if you're that's married. <laughs> If you're married with children, you should just get double points for everything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it hats off to Eric. He's got three kids. Yeah. Uh, but this yeah, picture is one that surprised me in terms of uh, the colour. I presume that the colour in these bushes in the foreground must have been accentuated, differentiated in post-processing. But it's again, it's pretty bang on the raw file uh, yeah. with just a standard Adobe standard profile. Yeah. And we should probably say that that isn't the expectation of the awards that every image is bang on the raw file. It's just no, no, amazing when, yeah. when it does happen that way. Yeah, yeah that's probably worth uh, making an addendum about that because we've certainly given that impression to some extent so far. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. you can see with some of the images, there's quite a lot of contrast or saturation applied potentially. And, and you know, a lot of the judges uh, either have a digital background where they've been working with colour quite extensively or, you know, some... You know, those that have shot film have been shooting Fuji Velvia, so there's not some sort of aversion to editing, and uh, yeah, we wouldn't want people to think mm. that. Mm. Unless something has departed quite radically from the the colour, for instance, of um, the what what the subject matter is, it's well, then I mean, a matter you of taste. Use those lodestone words, you know, integrity and authenticity to the to the landscape to keep. Mm. keep Along on the shore of that image, what is that? It's just. Fabulous, <laughs> and, and yeah. you know whether it's edited to death or or not edited to death, um, it's just a fabulous image. It's 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 you know it just speaks to you immediately. Um, so no wonder it did well, and it doesn't matter um, really whether it's um, obviously it's got to be within the rules of the the, the competition. But um, you know the fact that it's really close to the raw file doesn't matter to the judges when it's you know this good um it's just yeah perfect, perfect just a, such a soft image it's hard mm. to imagine what you, more you could do to something like that you oh you'd ruin it you'd around ruin too it. much yeah. and yeah. you'd just fall apart so yeah yeah, yeah. so delicate all right moving on so that, that that's beautiful. one of the beauties of you know having a stage like this and it being an open stage to amateur and otherwise is getting introduced to a lot of people's work well, we just we just had the artist on the on the show just but mm. earlier. <laughs> you guys missed her pre-show. Matt, you might be able to speak to this a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well, I think in um, competitions you see a lot of Milky Way images, but I think this is in it doesn't fall under the terio- the stereotype of a Milky Way image. It's actually about the Boab, and it has uh, such a spiritual feel to the image that's been captured really beautifully and quite subtly for an astro photography image. It's and a it's, magnificent um, use of zodiacal light, using that as the backlight for um, the the um, tree itself. So she would have very deliberately worked out the angles and and made sure that she found a subject that was was able to backlight that. And it's, it's really a, a beautiful feature to be able to use in pictures, which is quite a rare occurrence. Or so it was hard to see it in in such a vivid way. I've probably only seen it like that myself a few times, a handful of times. So. Um, what's what's so, interesting so, to me is that you, you could simplify this and create like a vertical prop in the middle and, and that would be almost the more expected kind of interpretation of, of, of that scene. And yet it's given this asymmetry and this extra kind of negative space and breathing room around to, to be present with, which, which to me is part of its uniqueness. Absolutely. Hmm. Mm. Well, and we did, we did see a lot of, uh, of Milky Way images. I think a lot of people saw the Astro results and were disappointed that the kind of astro they they love didn't do well. Um, one thing we we did see quite a lot of is these sort of like almost elongated globes, 3D globe Milky Ways that almost look like they've been stuck onto the, the sky. Um, so there was a lot of quite heavy editing still in, in the Astro Awards. And one of the reasons this stood out is aside from the fact that obviously the white balance has been shifted a bit more into that blue magenta area, it's obviously a very straight starscape. I mean, if you shoot, the Milky Way, um, ISO 6400, and, you know, 20 seconds. This is more or less what you get. And then a white balance shift gets you the rest of the way. And I, I think, again, for those photographers at that very top end of the game, they're kind of potentially tired of those tricks of just making the Milky Way look as wild as possible. And so seeing this very simple version with the purity of it is, is very appealing. Mm. 
Mm. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. And also just keeping the shadows nice and dark, not having to pull out a whole bunch of crazy detail and distract the eye around from the away from the, the central subject. So yeah. really nice. Beautiful. Well done, Mika. Very jealous. <laughs> Glow worms. Reminds yeah. me of home and Altaro, Kiwi Land. We got into trouble for this one, didn't we, Tim? We did indeed, yes. It's, oh, in uh, terms of night sky. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, yeah. that's quite an interesting uh, conversation that would have been, I imagine. Yeah, it could have been taken in the middle of the day. Well done, gents. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I yeah, that, what do you consider a sky? I, I think that was part of the criticism. I mean, it was wi- widely loved by the judges. Um, I, I think we maybe didn't consider how it might be perceived by the community and whether we you know change change rules in in future i don't know i mean it's it's funny when you have a description for a category people will then look at the winners and then really pick apart the words that you use and i think we said something like should include the night sky as one of our sort of guideline things and people are like well it's disqualified then um but i mean i i think that would have been an unreasonable reaction really to what's a really strong image that that every everybody loved um so yeah I think conceptually it is a nightscape. That's what it feels mm. like. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's not like it doesn't doesn't feel like it. It feels like it belongs there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Photographers have a way of surprising you when it comes to rules. Um, there was a competition that I was working on and we had an aerial category, um, but we also had an aerial image in the landscape category. And the workaround was that the aerial image had been taken by a satellite and we hadn't attri- um, considered satellites in the rules of the competition. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, first year writing new rules, you've done pretty well. <laughs> God, it's just that the subtlety of that hue in the back is what really makes this image for me. Mm, just in there. It gives it depth, it pulls you through the frame. You know, that, that alliteration of that uh, and the oh, the cloud feature, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's distracting, but also it's appealing at the same time. Mm. It's uh, like a portal going kind of on here around the back there, like a like a halo. Mm. Yeah. I think one of the things that the judges liked in in some of the better performing nightscapes was the integration of the the, the sky with the land, mm. so the whole thing works yeah. together. Yeah, yeah, which is not easy to do, uh, purely from an exposure point of view for starters, and, and just an understanding of technically as well. And we did have yeah, a great conversation about the sort of blue hour blends. Uh, where you can take a picture just as the sun's setting to get some light and then you wait an hour or so to get the, the night sky and then we, we, we decided that wasn't really an integral. It's, there's a sense of not representing what was there in that, I think. Time blending. Even, uh, even though it's a brilliant think, creative solution. No, I, I think you've, you've made the right decision based on what the ethos of the awards are. Um, mm. yeah, definitely made the right decision, I would say. I think if I were an astrophotographer entering next year, I would be thinking about how I was going to get some light on the foreground that looked appealing without Mm. light painting. Because I think there is a tendency of astrophotographers to just go out when it's new moon and they've got this perfect starscape when actually a lot of the images that did well that maybe even didn't get to the very final stages uh, did well because they had some form of light balance, either because it was very late twilight or there was a half moon or whatever it might be. Because if you do want that integration between the landscape, which is ultimately what the competition is for, landscape photography, uh, and the night sky, then that might be the best way to do it, I think. Mm, That's a very good point. It's a lot harder to put, pull up the shadows too if it's the, the new moon as well. It's hard work. Yeah, yeah oh, to wow, me, there, there's a lot of social commentary there, or, or you know, about the potential of global warming and its impacts as as well through the smoke yeah. and the fire, and and it just it just it just has a whole level of tiers of of, of voice here. Uh, and lots of different ways to move and it's 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 arresting but it's also disturbing and it's also beautiful and and it's also quite deep in terms of where you can move in terms of its interpretation is that a shaft of moonlight through there is it yeah it is moonlight yeah Yeah. and and that's what i think is really freaky about the photo is that shaft of moonlight i just think that's amazing the the smoke's made it possible i guess to see that yeah 
Yeah, yeah. Visual, it's, pointed yeah. Straight, it's pointed straight at the fire. It's like we're getting a message from up high that climate change yeah. is real yeah. and look what it's doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure with the white with the color temperature of the moonlight. I wasn't sure whether it was like a, a rescue helicopter or something with a spotlight on, but it's mm. way too big for that when you look at the scale of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a big light source, whatever it is. Mm. Sorry, we we'll skip one there, yeah. I think. Yeah. Another moonlight, moonlit shot that's mm. yeah, beautiful. Yeah. It's just such a beautiful meander through the frame of this, isn't it? And you're just rewarded on, on your whole journey all the way through, really. And apparently in the States, this, this is actually a well-known location. But I think what set this apart, again, is that integration of, of the land and, and the sky and that you do have a bit of detail coming in there, some layering effects. It's not just a silhouette in the Milky Way. Mm. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that's why the judges liked it. Mm. Gorgeous. So that's the winner. Dang. Well, that's a pretty pretty special capture, really, isn't it? I wonder how long yeah, it was, whether it's it's just one hit or... One, one um, ten-second exposure. Wow. Uh, that's probably just one hit. And, oh, it's two, it looks like two strikes, but one frame. That's yeah. Right. Oh, two strikes. Oh, they say lightning doesn't strike the same place twice, but it's pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, when you've, got a, when you've got a mountain like that sticking up, Waiting for the lightning to come. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, this Amazing. looks like this looks like um, one of um, Nikola Tesla's um, experiments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like a plasma ball, um, and um, yeah, yeah, absolutely stunning. Must have been hard to meter something like that too, like in terms of how extremely bright the lightning would have been versus the darker scene and and not overexposing it. And like it might have been pitch black the frame beforehand um, to, you know, even out the exposure there, mm. I'd imagine. So I think having some differentiation in those little lightning strikes, the sort of missing trailers was a, was a big differentiator there. Mm. Yeah. And just that beautiful left to right flow, you know, like it, it has a very curvaceous feel about it. Um, yep. Yeah. That negative space on the top right is really needed to balance out all the, all the energy on yeah, the Yeah, it sort of does that sort of thing, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 There was a lot of conversation good. about that little black um, mini peak in the foreground, bottom left. Foreground, yeah. Uh, some people saying it really distracted them and some people saying it didn't bother them at all. So that's a... Yeah, interesting. I didn't Don't even do know much it. about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I didn't notice it at all when I when I first saw it. In fact, until it was pointed out. I think yeah. it's it, this photo is actually a good example as well of the moment in landscape photography, which is definitely a part of, of what we do, that sometimes it's just an incredible instant. And that is one thing that landscape photography can be very good at. A bit a bit like wildlife photography, you know, quite often it's it's about that moment. Yeah. Cool. I was thinking of um, well, I just want to make sure there's enough time for Max to talk about his project and um maybe have a quick bit about mine so i don't know which way we want to go we've got about um you can make a call on that oh, we work through these there's not too many here we'll go through those first and we'll maybe jump to match next oh, take me there ah oh, mr bennett i don't know you've done much drone work you're a little sneaky <laughs> i'll have to ask him about that um, I'm looking forward to getting cut loose. So I haven't really been a drone photographer at all, only in the last year or two. So if you look at my Instagram, I'd say 99.9% .9 of them are all done at a helicopter side of balloons, micro lights, or whatever other thing flies in the sky. Mm. Kevin's doing beautiful work as a German photographer. He's, he's in Africa at the moment, going to town. I just spoke to him a couple of days ago. This is a feature that I've photographed many times, and I haven't seen it done this subtly, to be honest. Um, there's, there's, there's no limit to how far you can push the, the color palette that you get in a place like this and the what i've never seen it almost so understated yeah. uh, which i think is what really stands out for me mm. so, so silky yeah 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 but for you guys in the uk australia is a big place but paul's seen every square inch of it from the air <laughs> <laughs> so he can he can isolate whatever whatever abstract it is he knows where it is i thought that was that's the sharp bay area isn't it that way. yeah yeah it's yeah. it's um on the eastern southeastern shore of, of one of the main peninsulas of the sharp bay yeah. so there, there was some pretty wild editing in the uh in the aerials actually mm. tim tim was trying to recreate some of the edits and more or less set up a rule that if you'd put the contrast oh, out of the raw files, we'd be having a go. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've got somewhere I was I was 
Well, what, what I did as a, as a little rule was see, see if I could recreate the edit and then apply it to a, a low contrast landscape to see if it looked ridiculous or not, mm -hmm. <laughs> saying, okay, if you need to put that much editing on, then it probably doesn't really represent what's there, given, yeah. given the fact that they are low contrast. So you've got some leeway there. Yeah, so I mean, often, yeah, often in Australia, particularly you're shooting through a lot of smoke or haze or different things as well. So um, there, there were some cases where you'd have, say, um, some mud that was slightly bluish and some mud that was slightly orangish. And the blue would be taken to a strong cyan and the orange would be taken to a rich red. And yeah, so I mean, it, it wasn't even just contrast. It was huge hue shifts as well to create shifts. this. Sort yeah, of that's and and, and very localized ones as well. Yeah. Mm. And it was very effective, but you have to still look at that kind of edit in the context of the whole competition. Mm. Well, Tim would have enjoyed mine because it was pretty much a straight raw shot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We will talk about yours in a minute, Paul. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Come on. <laughs> so, yeah, I've seen and, uh, sort of far more dramatic shots and close-ups of, of this landscape, but I don't think I've seen it with that sense of breadth and, and that a soft yeah. kind of voice running all the way through. There's a lot of room to just sigh through the whole landscape that you're drawn to, you know, by the peaks at the back and the light pulling you through the frame, you know, it's, it's not just focused in the foreground. You can, you can wash it all the way through and around this image slowly, which I, I really appreciate about. It's also refreshing to see an oblique with a horizon, which is um, normally yeah. most of the things is always top down. So yeah, it's nice to see an, ele an like an elevated there's, there's grand landscape. Less, there's a lot um, less drones in the world. Thanks to this volcano. <laughs> <laughs> we we saw a lot of volcano shots from this volcano. So there were three projects that were just on the volcano and gotcha. there were a lot of entries in the uh, aerial category um, from, from the volcano as well. But I think this one stood out because it has that, that grander wide, wide view and that perfect combination of, of two, two events, the sunrise and, and the eruption really happening. Um, and, and Stefan Forster who was one of our judges has a lot of, uh, weeks spent at this volcano uh, trying to get really uh, strong images and he was particularly impressed by this because it's just a comparatively uncommon combination with the volcano actually erupting because it's not constantly erupting and then to have that beautiful sunrise as well and obviously a very strong composition too. Yeah, very so strong. is this the Icelandic one or? Yeah this is the Icelandic yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. There's a very similar coloration too. It's like it's uh, mirrored in the sky, which is yeah, really cool. that, that's that's, that's one, of the most, one of the most elegant parts of that image, mm. the matching of that tonality. Is that the runner-up or that is third place? This is third the runner-up here. Oh gee, <laughs> oh, I hadn't seen that one before. Go, Nick. Oh look, oh, just having all those sheep, which I assume that's what they are, um, yeah. contained in that shadow. Absolutely, like there's nothing outside that shadow that's um, that's remarkable. Just as an event, um, yeah. Well, clearly, the sheep were attracted to the shadow for some reason. I don't know why, but just getting uh, out of the sun, probably. Yeah. So once yeah. we once we get away from the wow, the sheep are in the shadow aspect of it. I mean, the raking the raking light across the landscape is just highlighted in such beautiful textures that mm. you know, sort of, um, you know, we have them crisscrossing a bit and then swirling in the top top left they they come down and they swirl into that shadow and then you're leading through to the trees and then then back out to the top right it's um it's really quite quite a stunning image and um yeah yeah and and beautiful colors i mean uh, uh i guess it, it might be pushing the saturation a little bit but um, reasonably heavy on the processing yeah I, I, I was a little bit well let's say concerned but it was it was pushing the edge of uh what i'd like to see Mm, mm. Yeah, but the yeah, the, I mean, just without the sheep, <laughs> it'd be um, a fantastic image. But the sheep yeah. really um, sets this apart. That was an interesting question regarding animals in the landscape as well, because it's it, it should you allow them or should you allow them, shouldn't you allow them? Because it introduces a an obvious narrative that people like, mm. and does it give them an advantage? Just just as if you put a human in a landscape. However small they are, it becomes scale, contextual. Yeah. It takes over. It's and what you, what are your a, thoughts on that? It's a graphic element in this image. It's not you're not yes. seeing an individual um, 
animal as such. I mean, we know they're sheep because of the, the context of the image or, or similar to sheep, whatever they are. They could be you know, alpacas or something, I don't know. But, um, but I can't really tell. Uh, it's just a, a textual element for the image, really, um, yeah. and, uh, and, and a, a very contrasting textual element to the rest of the scene. And I, I think um, if it was focused right in on the sheep, then no, that's not going to be so much a landscape, but it's really just a graphical element inside this landscape in this particular case. I, I, yeah, I mean, you, these, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want a single animal like... Um, I don't know, a kangaroo and then say maybe some burnt forest behind it and then focusing on the kangaroo, that would be that would be That's terrible. Well, that'd be, that'd be wildlife. <laughs> with with these, I find as well, um, you know, that it's all, all about nature and that I don't see this as like a I see this as like a sort of farmland or, or something like that too. And I sometimes in competitions in like nature photography competitions, I'll see like a pine plantation or things like that. And for me, it sort of takes an edge off it um, just for the fact that it's not, um, you know, nature as, as you know, a, a natural landscape in terms of that aspect, I suppose. Yeah, that was one of my first thoughts about this. I mean, it's a, it's a heavily sculpted landscape by man uh, with domesticated animals. So it's kind of, um, well, I can't assume that, but that's the feeling I get straight away. So, but, you know, outside of that. Questions. We did get questions about that in terms of, Wet by natural? Do you mean like no, no man-made elements in it? And mm. uh, we we figured quite quickly we'd have to ban most of the UK photography. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was there say, isn't much yeah. that hasn't been affected by man, really. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. I think mean, just as long as there's transparency in, in the rules, and, mm. and it's all good. Yeah, Maybe I think the only good. only point where it starts to get a little bit complicated is with the intimates. You know, uh, David Ward is a landscape photographer, but actually a lot of his subjects are man-made subjects that are sort of partially reclaimed by the landscape you know mm. uh, like rusted doors and things like that is that a landscape probably not so how big can the rusted door be in the landscape and it, it's a little <laughs> bit tricky with some of those it's, but... it's a good conversation to keep going really um yeah there's a there's a fluid line really and uh, it's worth exploring all right, so all right. Schmuck. <laughs> well done so i would be interested to hear what what Maybe if you had any memories of what conversations went, went on about this one. I, I think one, one thing that a lot of the judges mentioned, well, oh, I know Joe Cornish did as well, was um, the sort of very strong environmental concept of this sort of like swirling blue. It's almost like if you wanted an image that was symbolic of climate, then, you know, it's, it's like a low pressure system or, a, you know, a hurricane, isn't it? So it has that very immediate sort of secondary meaning. I think the judges also like the fact that they didn't know what it, what it was. We speculated that it was ice, but then the milky look to it is, doesn't quite chime with that. So I still don't know what it is, actually. We like, um, I like the idea, and I think the judges like the idea that it's, uh, it could be pristine glacier ice with sort of broken up uh, pack ice around it. Or it could be what it probably is, which is a, a semi-polluted landscape, or somewhere in between. It doesn't matter, and I think that that ambiguity of the subject matter, and you can read into it as what you like, was part of why people liked it. What is it, Paul? Come on. Oh no, I, I like just to leave things how they are. But, okay, but, fair enough. Fair but enough. I think I mean it's it's I mean that's partly why I take the landscape the, the horizons away, and I, I take away a sense of scale most of the time in my work, and leave sort of ambiguity it just sort of pulls you away from your literal mind and, and invites sort of you to engage part of yourself in there, I think, and let the right brain in, you know, is it about a sound, a feeling, a, a texture, a, a, um, a symbol, you know, what, what, what are the other sort of levels going on here that aren't so literal or, or affecting present? And that's, that's one of the great beauties and strength, I think, of, of very work and abstract, any type of abstract work, really. And that's why, as I was saying before, I, I, I love allowing that mystery to be present, you know, um, and that's partly where the, that flip side of having to put it in an aerial category and say that it is sort of takes that away a little bit. Yeah, I do, get, that, yeah, I do still, get that point, Paul. Yeah, I've it's, you've, it's you've, still managed to keep itself mysterious enough to, to, to remain appeal. I, I think, you know, I felt particularly stoked about this one and that it's basically a raw file. Um, I actually just looked at it for a competition a couple of hours ago and it's basically identical to the raw. There's, there's nothing but a crop. Um, and that's quite satisfying to, to um, I guess, to rise to the fore in that regard when, when a lot of other arenas that I'm working in 
you know, you, you feel pressure to somehow try and improve something or add something or compete with people that are doing really fantastical work. And I, I almost felt like a sigh of relief that um, there's something that's just there on its own merit. And I think the cropping was, gives it its its structure and its its power, I think. Um, it's actually, you know, it's a 3-2 uh, format image um, from my camera. But um, yeah, hats off to those guys. It would have been interesting to be in the room about that. And um, mm -hmm. You know, I really didn't know what was going to rise to the four. I think I got asked for 12 raw files, but I had no idea what ended up where. And, um, and literally, I only, I only shot this on a wing and a prayer just um, a couple of months ago um, on a COVID dodging, dangerous exercise around Australia that could have been a complete disaster. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I literally lost my lunch about five minutes before taking this photograph. And I think I was holding a bag full of my breakfast while I was taking the shot. <laughs> so, so I'm also kind of kind of appreciate the the irony of um oh should we turn around and go back and i was like oh, no i just keep going you know and i was just hanging out the window shooting with one hand just feeling like absolute rubbish but just not wanting to give up on on my dream and um coming across a feature like this was my reward i think i think the, comp so, the compositional framing of it is fantastic just the way the way anyway, it we, flows around the image we know what it is now as well it's uh it's paul's puke Swirling <laughs> <laughs> towards the ground. There's yeah. probably a few bits of it that fell into the frame. Some vortex. At some stage. Yeah. Oh, I did yeah. circle around it a couple of times. It's really difficult to get right on top of an image to keep that perspective um, crisp and clear and not have to warp anything. And, and um, particularly in a fixed wing plane, you know, with quite a lot of turbulence and movement that was happening in a crazy Czech pilot that spent more time sending messages on his mm. phone and flying, <laughs> flying the plane. <laughs> Did you uh, push the crop in at all, Paul, or is it just literally lopping the sides? No, it's just literally lopping the sides, really. Yeah. It's, it's pretty close. I think there's a little bit more room on the bottom right, I think, and maybe on the yeah. bottom of the frame. Uh, yeah. So it's probably in probably about one, I don't know, about half anyway, but it's, you know, you can use your, your plane as a very expensive zoom, uh, <laughs> or you can just go with what you've got. Yeah. Well, anyway, I Better move on, I think. Um, yeah, we're we're running out of time. I, I think we should um, look at Paul uh, at, um, at Matt's, Matt's work. project. Yeah, while well, we've got him here, we haven't given uh, Matt as much voice as he could. So, I don't know if Tim and Alex are this, but as far as I know, is what the whole folio was shot in Tasmania or pretty close to it? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure all of that's Tasmania. Mm. Yeah, that was Hearts. Um, that one's down the Gordon River Road along uh, Scott's Peak Road. So a lot of fortuitous kind of spotting of interesting things and then, um, you know, zooming in on the, the one bit that interested me. So this was um, just light coming over the back of a hill at the end of the day, just hitting the treetops. I kind of felt like the color palette on that almost feels a little bit oriental or Japanese or in style, art style. Um, which is pretty cool because I don't think I've actually done that well with this image. <laughs> so I'm pretty glad that it's in something now. I mean, that's the, that's the good thing about the project category, isn't it? That when you see these more contextual images as part of a body of work, they become more powerful as, as part of that set rather than the standalone images. Mm. Because actually, I think many of these photos on their own, they wouldn't have had a look in, but together they are incredible, right? And, and that's the whole benefit of having a, having a project. Mm. yeah did you want to talk about the, the project itself matt um well, I guess I can so talk a little are... bit about it yeah i feel like it's um on your show it's a little bit not as exciting because i think we talked about ash when i came on one time but yeah. uh, it's basically my kind of own personal response to the bushfires that happened in tasmania uh particularly in 2019 but i think there's a couple of photos from the fingal fires that happened a, a year or two after that like as well. Lemon, uh, yeah. yeah, that was um, about 15 minutes down the road from where I was living at the time, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, looking up where the fire um, kind of meeting points and that where the community was. And I found out that the meeting point was actually my front yard. So I was pretty <laughs> safe, but um, this wasn't too far away. Um, but yeah, I just felt like a, a compulsion that I needed to say something or do something about it. Um, and I guess this is kind of my way of um, bringing the impact of climate change and, and what can happen uh, to an audience that might not get out into these places as well. Mm. And there like, is a, an a element of hope in some of the images in terms of the regeneration, but uh, also 
I guess it becomes more monocultural uh, after the fires when you're losing species that can't adapt to fires the same way as some of the species are. There's a hint of redemption, but it's definitely not recovery. Mm. Yeah. This this particular image is one of my favourites in the main competition as well. Yeah, thank uh, you. It's an absolutely beautiful image. Do you, do you want to speak about the the kind of ethos behind the project aspect of the competition and, and how how well it was taken on? Because I think you had a quite a massive um, selection of projects to go through, didn't you? Surprising amount, yeah. Um, I, I can't remember exactly how many there were, but it was there was hundreds. Mm, um, yeah. In fact, I'd say majority of people entered a project, so there must have been at least fourteen hundred. Wow! Uh, if you take the fact you can enter two projects, we wanted something that allowed just what we said is to allow images to become more than what they are individually. So either through a sense of narrative or through a sense of connection between different images. Mm. We're, all, we're all fans of books. Um, and we wanted to bring that element of what a book becomes mm. into the yeah. competition. And it's, it's, you know, it's a difficult one because I know uh, one of the other judges was, was uncertain about allowing people to enter 12 images for a, for a short, for a small amount of money. Um, but we were, we were like, well, it, it's got to be a single project has got to be competitive with the price of entry mm. for the rest of them. So it's it, we, we thought yeah. about the project as like a single entry. Yeah, you know, and it's, yeah it's going to be judged as a, as a cohesive body of work. It's not like yeah. they're, they're getting 12 free shots at it. They're getting one shot at the, that category. That category yeah. So, yeah, it makes perfect sense that it's well-priced. Um, we, we are tempted to try and promote some images out of the project category into the main categories. Then it becomes a bit controversial because you can enter things into the projects and hope they get pulled out. But there, there, was, there was some amazing pictures in projects that we would have loved to be able to introduce into the main uh, competition. I'm not sure what people think about that. I know the wildlife photographer of the year does this quite often. Is that something that you're looking at with the book that you're going to produce to highlight some of those images? Yes, I think I think we definitely want to extract some. We want to try and show as many projects as possible, but it's quite difficult mm -hmm. in the volume of a book. So it may be that we we pick a few, like a handful of images for a few projects just to represent them, and then maybe link out to a gallery on a dedicated website. I mean, as far as the book goes, the slightly unfortunate thing is, I mean, I think the best book would ultimately come from showing either people's projects or people's portfolios, so the collections of work that they'd entered. And you could very happily do multiple books just on this year's awards, showing people's portfolios, because quite often images that just don't work on, on their own, they, they're just so much better as part of it when they have context, when they're seen within a body of work, whether that's in a project or just the photographer's general work that they've entered into the competition. So that is a, a real problem that we've got to try and solve when we do this book. Mm. Can I ask Matt a question about um, conservation work and the, the idea of the eyewitness tradition in photography and how far can you take things in post-processing and mm -hmm. still keep them as a conservation image? Is it important? Uh, I think it really depends on context. Um, so personally, yeah. Like I value a competition like this for its authenticness, but I also value competitions where people just go completely mad and create whatever they can think of. Um, so I would bring up a photographer like Karen Allsop, for instance, who has conservation messages in her work, but it's completely comp um, composite work, uh, very illustrative, you know, that animals become characters and that kind of thing. And I think it really depends on what you're trying to communicate and in what space you're doing that. And I think there's actually a, a, um, a space for both of those kinds of works, I think. Um, but ultimately, for me, it's really about telling the story. And if you can tell a story in a way that's taken honestly, I think that's even better. Um, because yeah. you know, the, moment that, yeah, the moment that you're caught out of one thing, well, that's everything that's gone that you've been working for. So, yeah. Agreed. Um, we probably need to look at the... Um, the photographer of the year. Uh, yeah, so we we we've, photograph we've of the year. We'd need another hour to go through the rest of them. So my, yeah. my thought <laughs> is maybe the photograph of the year and and the winning kind of folio would be a nice way to finish up. Yeah. Um, 
And I think this is the winning folio been... by Eric Bennett. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible image. I love that the plant oils start to look like brachia geology. Yep. Beautiful. I just couldn't even wrap my head around this one. <laughs> just, yeah, it's pretty insane. It's just it? fantastic on its own right, just by being what it is. Um, conceptually, it's just so otherworldly. Yeah. I think the great thing about Eric's collection of work is that it had a lot of variety, but it did have continuity too. Mm. Um, so you can kind of see that it's the same photographer. And part of that is, you know, the, the way he shoots his compositional style and part of it's his editing style. But although they're quite disparate, um, images with a lot of variety, they do still seem to fit together fairly well. That, that, could that could you sort of describe just... that a little bit more um, conceptually? Like, what, what are the threads that link through his images in terms of his style and approach? Like, even more like. I, I think the way that he handles color is very consistent. I think, um, you know, if, if you look at his edits, he's very good at showing the color of the subject in quite a rich and engaging way, um, but without editing in a way that gets in the way of the content. And, and so to me, the, the images feel very natural whilst also having that sort of, I don't know, extra flavor of a slightly magical quality to them. So that's what I see visually when I, when I look at his images. And then compositionally, he's very refined. He's very clean with the way he shoots. So although the subject matter is, is very different, you see this um, fairly consistent use of, of pattern um, and, and repetition. And I mean, I guess uh, in this case, balance, but uh, yeah, I think there's an amazing consistency despite the, the variety. Um, I'm, I'm really keen. I think we're going to get Eric Bennett on shortly, which is great. So we'll get to talk a lot more about his work. work. But Luke, I, I am keen to see Ben Horn's um, yeah. runner-up portfolio because it is absolutely stunning. And of course, those that don't know Ben Horn, he shoots large image um, film, a uh, large format film. And um, it's quite a, a striking portfolio. And I think we should just quickly run through it. So this is all... Uh, 10 by 8 um, inch negative film, I, I think. I should, add, I should add that this is probably the most expensive. The one with the stone in the, in the tree is probably the most expensive image entered in the competition because it's actually a focus stack using 10-8. Oh, oh. Yes, serious. <laughs> that, that, is, that is absolute commitment. That's commitment. Oh, that my is, goodness. Yeah. I'd yeah. say probably one of the most unique images that I've seen in a while as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Oh, it's beyond stunning. Yeah, I think that might be one of the ones is you can buy the actual um, original from his website. He's got it for. A, oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? He's he's, yeah. he's making commentary on NFTs and and selling his um, original. Ah, I like, I like yeah, it. Yeah. For a huge amount. Yeah. Well, let's see the other way of doing it. <laughs> well, his argument is that you're getting one of one, but you're really getting the the real deal. Yeah. You're getting the real deal, a lot less. Yeah. Real one of one. Yeah. Not a Pokemon card thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell me any more. You got any reflections on on this body of work? Um, I, I mean, I, I think all of all of the judges. Were you asking about the competition? Oh no, about Ben's yeah. Ben's folio. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think um, all of the judges thought that this was just a, a, another amazing portfolio, and and that the diversity was really good as well. I think Eric's just had that like extra bit of, of sparkle to it maybe that, that caught, pe caught people's eyes um but yeah I think this was a fairly unanimous second place as well because again it has that very consistent style good variety and you know technically it's 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 really amazing I mean obviously every single one of these photos it just looks like you're there right mm. um and some of them are really textual I mean I think that that rock coming through the the tree there that's you know, you just want to touch that because yep. the texture is so engaging. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yep. So. We'll move on to the um, image of the year. Is that up here? Photograph of the year. Higher up. Yeah, yeah that must have been a great conversation. Ugh. It was actually a very easy conversation because <laughs> it was so unanimous. Oh, but, really? Um, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think... So what we did was we picked all the category winners and then we went through the process of choosing the overall winner and then the runner up in the 
category would then be boosted to the top place you know just work mm. it like that um but it was a bit of a foregone conclusion to be honest mm. and that's that's no, nothing against uh the other winners of course but this image that you know would have been the winner of the intimate category i think it has so much mystery about it and so much narrative to what's a very simple subject that people would would pass by mm. i think it was a fairly obvious choice in many ways because you know, it, it's it's almost ideal for our competition as well to sort of symbolise everything that we would want to achieve in our first year, which is putting an unknown artist to the fore, um, showing content that people might otherwise ignore, showing narrative and creativity, because, I mean, you, you know, it's, it's obvious that there's a, a landscape, wider landscape story here as well, this sort of mountain and moon. Um, and then the the a slight bonus at the end was we found out that it was a film photo which just makes it mm. even better because it shows that film can compete with digital still so um it was kind of lucky that this image was entered in in many ways i think it's an almost perfect winner for what we'd like to show in our first year it's mm. quite nice that it's a, a photograph taken at an iconic location that hundreds of thousands of people must have walked past similar things maybe not exactly the same but it shows that there's potential and you shouldn't just say iconic locations are bad because if you can go to an iconic location and do something creative it still has immense value it's like the yeah you can imagine everyone's looking out over the water trying to get sunset or sunrise or something like that and there's this one person stands looking right at the beach and go, what are they looking at you know that's notorious for uh having a plethora of people that almost make it impossible to get a shot without a person in it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and here it's sort of like, well, just what's it, what's at your feet. It's, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a bit beyond words in a lot of ways, really. I, I, I don't, I feel like rambling on in my own words is, is not going to do it any favors, but, but what I, what I like about the conversation that you, you just started there, Alex, which might be a good way to sort of start wrapping up the show is, is how successfully, so this image represents what you were, your purpose and intention was for this competition in the first place. And and I guess I'd love to finish the show maybe on any reflections that you guys have so far and maybe where to from here. Yeah. I mean, I, I, go on, Tim. Go on, Alex. I will say then, um, the the main thing for me when I, when I got involved in the competition and when we started talking about it was that the the, the winners are important because it is a competition, but the book that we're putting together now will be the, the real goal for myself. Um, taking those, a larger selection, a larger profile of images and trying to present them to show what our concept means is, is important. So when we get that published on out there, uh, I'm getting quite excited about that. Mm. Is that going to be like a print-on-demand thing for people, or how is it going to be accessible? No, we've uh, we're going to a, a printing company in America who prints from South Korea, and it's going to be a book that's very much like uh, Alex Nail's book, fine quality, one hundred and eighty page hardback fine art book. Mm. Beautiful. And the idea is to use the remainder of the fees that we have from uh, people, or at least a significant portion, to subsidise the book for entrance. So you'll be able to buy a fine art book at a, a much cheaper price. Of course, the difficulty is going to be with all the shipping and all that kind of stuff, which you, you guys probably get, going to get hammered with in, in Australia. But yeah, um, yeah we, we'd, we'd love the book to be this sort of showcase um, I mean, if we're talking about what our dream would be for the awards is that people would actually want to collect these books because they see them as a who's who in landscape photography, a way of, of discovering original uh, original work that, you know, fits in with this ethos of, um, of natural landscape photography. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's the, the main goal now. Uh, slightly terrifying goal because I know how much work goes into a book and again we're, we're not paying ourselves to do it um, but yeah it's it's going to be really exciting uh, going through that process um, and and potentially we'll, we'll be selecting some images that weren't necessarily very high scoring images because we want to create a book that works well as a book um, and, and not just uh, present the absolute top scoring images um, but yeah, as, as for how the competition's gone, I mean, I think we're, we're all pretty grateful at how 
many people entered and how well it's been received how well it's been supported because actually that's uh, that's an endorsement of us as the organizers and an endorsement of the judges too that people have backed it in the way that they have um because of course the worst case scenario would have been that the whole thing fell flat on its face after we put all, all that work in so um i think that has been very satisfying for all of us and and now we kind of want to to push the competition onwards so that it it becomes more of a standard because whether we like it or not competitions are a big part of how landscape photography is viewed as a genre it's they are standard setting um, and it creates the expectations and conversations around landscape photography. Uh, so I think, you know, in, in future years, we'd, we'd just like to see it grow so that it becomes that sort of standard setter. Mm. Um, and yeah, ho hopefully, hopefully next year will be bigger than this year. I, yeah, I think you might be in for one of the biggest competitions in the world next year. If, if you've already, if you've already yeah. if you keep it, at that same kind of playing field, I think, geez, you get yourself ready. Yeah. <laughs> get, yeah. Some, get some sleep beforehand. But I guess hats off to you both for, you know, well, not both. There's, there's three or four of you involved, um, Matt and Rajesh. But it's, um, yeah, I, I personally think it's, you can already get a sense of the, the culture and, and level of community and support that's around it. Um, mm. And that's very, very apparent, apparent right from the word go. So, and I think people are going to find it very refreshing and empowering to to have a platform to they're a very accessible platform to express themselves and feel like that they have a voice with with more subtle and authentic work. You know, that's a bit harder to find, to be honest, and on the mm. world stage at the moment. Mm. I'm sure I speak for a lot of people um, in saying that I think this is a very important um, event that's happened. This competition and the the concept of this com uh, com competition coming together, um, I, I think it's important for the the direction and 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 um, uh, I, I don't know what the best words the love the love of the landscape um, in in photography um, and and pushing it in the right sort of way. Not that there's a right and a wrong way, but certainly um, a way that a lot of people feel very strongly about and. Um, yeah, I'd really like to thank you, Tim and Alex and Rajesh and uh, Matt for for the concept and putting this together and the clearly extremely hard work that you've done to make it a on the first year an extremely professional and professionally run um, competition that that is going to mean a lot in the future. It means a lot now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I just want to applaud well. the, the transparency of the whole process as well is also something that really stands out. You know, it gives it a sense of integrity and it's it's just kind of a bit of a shining light in the world, which is why I felt straight away I wanted to, wanted to do a show on it. Tim, we haven't really heard your sort of shining thoughts about um, reflections and, and where to's, but I would love to hear a bit of that. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy that I'm happy how it's gone, very happy. And, and it, it is interesting to see what we might be able to do in the future. We've got a few ideas. If it carries on being successful, we hope, hopefully it will be. Mm. But all the ideas will be about um, representation of artists. Uh, that, that's as far as it goes. If we if we become more successful, we'll be able to do more things. Awesome. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, hands on as the world opens up and becomes a little bit more settled, hopefully, then... In having a platform or a, or a traveling exhibition or things like that can, can be a wonderful platform for, for new artists to really get their voice being heard and to engage sort of community in a more real way than, than a less digital sort of way, which is which is why a book is a wonderful medium in between. You know, it creates a, a legacy and a, and a body of work that stands the test of time. It's very accessible, it's very travelable, and it's just very tangible as well, um, unlike a lot of what's out there. Matt, do you have any final words or reflections on... on your engagement with the whole process and, and we feel like this competition sits? Um, I think it's all been said, but I think it's so important to have a different voice in this kind of thing and highlighting different style of images and different subjects. And I think it's going to be even more successful next year now that people understand that this is a real deal when it comes to both to running the competition, but also into what's being selected and highlighted. So, yeah, that's off. Or on, yes. in my case, but. <laughs> Righto, Luke, what do you reckon? 
Yeah, well, look, thanks so much, um, everyone, for, for joining us. It's just been a real pleasure to have you with us and to be able to talk about such a fantastic competition and pour over some absolutely incredible images. Uh, very, very refreshing to be able to talk about this sort of stuff. Um, and, um, yeah, really excited uh, for myself to enter next year. I also um, uh, unforgivably didn't enter this year either. So, um, but, yeah, absolutely um, love what you guys are doing. And, and um, thanks again for joining us. And hopefully um, uh, down the track, we can also have you on um, to talk about um, your own projects and things like that too. So um, on that note, thanks everyone for joining us. And, I'll just um, say one thing, Luke, if people want to follow up and see the rest of the images, the, the website's naturallandscapeawards.com um, yeah, yeah. and it comes up pretty quickly. And, and, you know, apologies to whoever may be watching, we didn't get to, through every single one, but yeah, I feel like the, the quality and calibre of conversation was, was, was worth it regardless. Tim and Alex, thank you so much. Thanks uh, very much, guys. Today. Thanks for having us on. And, Enjoy um, the rest of if, your day. If you're up for it, we really, really would love to have either and both of you back again and, and give you, give yourself a bit of a, a louder and more personal voice. If that'd more, be wonderful. More than happy to. Definitely. Awesome. Awesome. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye